OTB AM. With Aviva, Ireland's largest insurer, celebrating 10 years of iconic sporting moments at the Aviva Stadium. 7.31 this morning, you're very welcome along to OTBAM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you every morning from 7.30 all the way through until 10 o'clock. Great show lined up for you today. Jacob Stockdale is going to talk to us about what he's been getting up to in lockdown, the changes that he's making to his game. That try against the All Blacks in the Aviva Stadium, that's coming your way in about uh, 40 minutes' time. We're going to hear from Gavin James, who's just announced a series of driving gigs around the country. We're going to talk with Kieran Sheehan, the Cork footballer who obviously spent a lot of time in Australia and is back now. This was supposed to be... The uh, first Cork and Kerry were supposed to be at the weekend, though, I think. Isn't that right? I saw, I saw pictures from the Kerry Mafia, Kerry Mafia on Instagram lamenting the fact that it was supposed to be... Was it last weekend or this weekend coming? Last weekend, right. unfortunately. So definitely not going to happen. Did you, yeah, maybe if it was did you, did that, you yeah, celebrate your been. traditional route of victory anyway? We, we actually did, we kinda did have a, a Zoom call, actually, which was obviously just as good as the real thing. How much did you win by? I like this is this is the year. Remember, I've I've been saying it since the start of the year, and I was saying it to AG and at the on last Friday's show that, like, I told you that Kerry wouldn't get the job done against Cork this year, and I was right. They didn't beat them. Fair enough. Uh, you you were a hundred percent correct in your assertion that they uh, they didn't beat them so far. Anyway, who knows what's going to happen a little bit later on in the year. Gavin James, obviously, um, we recorded this piece yesterday. He made a, a big announcement yesterday that he's going to be back getting cars into drive-ins in um, Limerick and Cork and Galway and Dublin, I think, and it's not for another couple of months. So a lot will happen in those two months as the speed with which everybody goes back to some kind of uh, altered reality. Uh, is this something you would be interested in? Would you drive in? Would you do a, Would you go to a gig in a car, stick, stick your radio on and, and um, you know, experience the gig in your car? It, like... It's definitely better than nothing. I think it's a it's a very interesting idea. It's something that I, I don't know, I think when people go to gigs like it's something of this scale when it's at stadiums and things like that, people travel from far and wide to do it. They usually stay for the night. They usually walk into the ground and they're not hampered by the fact that one of their party has to to drive and stuff like that. So that's one of the obvious drawbacks. Uh, the obvious thing for it is that it's actual live music and live events and everybody's there. And like, uh, like we, I think Gavin will say himself later on that there's been, there's going to be some criticism of this, but I personally don't see it whatsoever. I don't, I don't see any justification for that. I think that any innovation is good innovation at this point. And who knows what it is in terms of a stepping stone as well. Like if, are, are the cars parked by one another in a ground does that suddenly become pods of people beside each other in a ground that are socially distanced and does that then become the gateway into a return to live events yeah like, i don't know like it, what, what about for, for for sports events is this something like could you see the people of liverpool drive into a massive arena to park up and watch them lift the title in an empty stadium for example i mean every uh, ga championship ground in the country has certainly in the 1980s had a lot of cars parked side by side, beeping their horns and flashing their lights. In their, it, it, there was a game last year that was played. It was one of the Tyrone games got refixed, and there was cars in the touchline, wasn't there? Was it Kerry? That was uh, earlier this year, yeah, in Dungannon. Yeah, um, yeah, in Eden Dork. There was, but in, yeah, there was, there was Dork. like, uh, there was beeping cars, beeping their horns to welcome the return of Colin McShane off the bench, which was fantastic. So. The, the GA are ahead of that already. Like it's, uh, you, you would be able to get, I would say, thirty cars into a game in Eden Dork. So that's clearly the future of it. That the All Ireland final could be played in Eden Dork, and then there's fifteen cars per team. Whoever beeps the loudest, obviously, has curated the home support for themselves. The past is the present; it's the future too. We all try to lie our way out of that, but life won't let us. It's one of my favourite quotes. Speaking of the past, time for us to get into this. Uh, Paul Rouse has been sharing his lecture series that he's been teaching for the best part of over a decade, I think, at this point, with the students of UCD. He's a professor of uh, history and has a particular interest, obviously, in sport. He's a brilliant, brilliant communicator, and every week we've been blessed to spend a bit of time in his company. This week they're talking about the War of Independence and 1916 and the GA's role in that. Have a look. Great stuff. Particularly interesting in Ireland, you have at the forefront of some kind of cultural war, the GAA. Like, I'm not sure if that was there in other countries necessarily in the form of a big sports organization. And they're trying to impose bans on its members and they're trying to fight the fight. 
And then equally, even within that, just to add a bit of complexity, lots of its own members think, oh, but I quite like soccer and I quite like going to the dance and so on. Yeah. Like the rules. So that is the very interesting melting pot up until, so that brings us what, to about 1910s? It gets you to the eve of war. Okay. And there's one thing about being able to, to call someone a Shawnee for playing cricket. And it's another thing for you to say, oh, they're only playing bog ball. It is a rhetoric in both ways. And it's cultural rhetoric and it's culture wars. But there's a massive difference between culture war and war. And what you saw in Ireland after 1912 was the pulling apart of the threads, both locally and then internationally, in which Ireland was involved in a global war, which left no space anymore for that kind of ambiguity. People were now forced to choose. So you, you see, for example, what happened after 1912. So 1912, the British government promised to introduce home rule for Ireland. It's put in the statute books. Ulster, as many people will know, or sections of Ulster, utterly reject the idea of home rule. They want to be, they want the parliament in London. They see themselves as utterly given to the empire and to the United Kingdom. So they found the Ulster Volunteer Force in, in response to this, and they run in arms, and they pledged to resist the idea of home rule in armed rebellion. In response to this, nationalists in the South formed the Irish Volunteer Force, and they, they, they formed this force, and they say from 1913 that they are going to defend the idea of home rule. So you get an increasing fraying in Ireland of a society where it's loyalist v. nationalist, unionist v. nationalist, mm. and it's so bad, it is so bad that it is, to the point of cliche, um, essentially, it's almost well, the outbreak of war in, in Europe in the summer of, of 1914 is almost welcomed as a reprieve from what's clearly an impending, what appears to be an impending civil war in Ireland. Okay. What about through the World War I years then? Oh, this is, this is where it gets... The, the minute the war breaks out, there's a meeting in the smoking room of the old castle restaurant in, in, in Belfast where uh, meeting members in that city of rugby, hockey, soccer, cricket, boat clubs, bowling clubs, rifle clubs, yachting clubs, they come together and they pledge to set up a battalion of people to, 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 to fight for the British Army in the war. The Northern branch, basically Ulster Rugby, uh, decided to s suspend all matches and they were followed in this by the Irish Rugby Football Union. All rugby matches stop in, in 1914. And it, because, as the circular said, it is felt that at the crisis of the empire, the formation of a battalion of people to fight would appeal strongly to the patriotism and sporting instincts of the young men. Um, and down, that, that's what happened in Belfast. And in Dublin, F.H. Browning, the president of the Irish Review, joined a call. He called on all the players and members, officials of Dublin rugby clubs to do their bit and to join the war effort. So they formed the Irish Rugby Football Union, formed a volunteer corps, and more than 100 members of that volunteer corps enlisted in the Dublin Fusiliers and went to fight um, for the British Army in, in Europe. And you see, for example, 35 members of Clontarf Rugby Club alone had joined the army. Um, and so there were about 300 in all rugby players who joined the, the volunteer corps initially, straight away. This is just straight away. This is not over a period of time. Um, and um, many of them, well, fought and died in Gallipoli, for example. And nine, nine Irish rugby internationals lost their lives um, during this period. And if you look even at club teams like UCC, UCC won the Munster Senior Cup in 1912 and 1913. And nine of the 22 players who played on those teams served in, in the war. And this was, was a story repeated all around the place. And it was only in 1919, 1920 that the rugby season was restored. So five years essentially without rugby. So I certainly get that the authorities are very much aligned with what we might traditionally think, you know, rugby, cricket, all of these sports want to help with the war effort. And we'll probably get on to GA now. What about on the ground, like some of those people, the volunteers, the players, like does it necessarily follow that in the main, I'm sure there were exceptions, but in the main, are we talking about an Anglo-Irish cohort who played rugby and then went to the war? Or were there just a bunch of lads as Irish as it gets who quite like rugby and then fell in with the rugby lads and went off to war as well? Um, it's a mixture of everything. So you do, you get people who absolutely identify with empire who try and go but the sheer swathe of people, this is one of those things that's conveniently or was for many years conveniently forgotten from Irish history, the extent to which the, the recruitment to the British Army was broad-based 
during this year, despite any rhetoric against enlistment. It is a simple fact that all across the society, there was huge enlistment. Those enlist, that enlistment came from for different reasons. There were people who identified with empire. Yeah. There were people who responded to the call from the Irish Nationalist Party that they should join the British Army in order to protect home rule, many of whom were GA people as well. Mm. And then you have people who went out of sheer economic need. They joined the army. And others who went undoubtedly for a, a, a sense of adventure. And then furthermore, others who probably felt guilty and had to go, and so on. Yeah. Uh, ascribing motivations is a really difficult, difficult thing in history. Thing. And ascribing in, 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 in my Leaving Cert history, the, 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 the strong memory I have is, this was very much taught to me as, this was the home rule effort. Yeah, and it doesn't, that, it, it, it doesn't wash. It, it doesn't wash just as that. It's, it's more than that. And you can see this as well. The impact on, on, on sport was, was kind of really interesting, depending on the sport. So soccer didn't stop during the war. Soccer kept going. The Irish League stopped, but it kept going on a, on a localised basis. And it depended then on, on what happened. But hockey stopped. And um, it, the hockey minute books are really interesting when they talk about the importance of doing their duty for king and country. And for Three Rock Rovers Club alone, 164 of their members fought in the Great War, 64 of whom, or 24 of whom, who died. Cricket, on the other hand, stopped. The Dublin Horse Show stopped. Uh, hunting kept going, horse racing kept going on a smaller scale, but still significant. Like there were still a lot of meetings took place, and there's the brilliant old um, retired historian, UCD Fergus Darcy. He he talked about how the world of horses imagined that Sarajevo was just a fiction, as if you know we continue our world will survive regardless of this, and we will keep going. And other sports, cockfighting continued. There are brilliant reports of illegal cockfighting taking place, for example, in Monaghan where there's 300 men at a cockfight and going on. But perhaps the most interesting story when it comes to recruitment to the First World War is to do with the GEA and what happened with the GEA. Because in the years after independence, and we will talk about this, I think, a little bit next week, the GEA constructed a story around itself in which none of its members had fought in the Great War and in which it had staffed the 1916 rising almost single-handedly. That's if you look at year after year, Congress minutes, uh, official statements by the GA and so on. That was the image that was created. And it's a nonsense. Yeah. I'm not shocked to hear that. So, <laughs> so England's misfortune being Ireland's opportunity. Did the GA see it that way? We, you know, if, if rugby wants to stop, we will continue. Did GA continue right through World War I? Yeah, the GA continued all the way through World War I. Um, and it was a really fascinating period in those years in Gaelic games. So Clare 1914, Clare won their All-Ireland, first All-Ireland Hurling Championship 1915, Leash won their first All-Ireland Hurling Championship. And then in football, Wexford footballers won four in a row with an extraordinary team who were very lucky, very unlucky not to win six All-Irelands in a row. They were an absolutely exceptional team. Mm. But around those teams, there were great stories. John Fox, the star of the All-Ireland Hurling Final for Clare in 1914, enlisted and fought in the British Army, joined up shortly after, after the final. And recruitment all across Ireland from GEA teams it was really, really interesting to watch. You look at Killaloo in County Clare, struggled to field a team. So many members have joined. St. Peter's in Belfast. Again, nine of their best players joined the team. And this is the extent of the, the, the enlistment from across Ulster, by the British Ar to the British Army, it was it was being superbly documented by Donald McAnallen in uh, in his publication about the sheer the sheer scale of it, and yeah. such was the scale of it that Leash GA in 1915, the year they win the All Ireland, they argue that this ban on G on British Army members being part of the GA has to be dropped for the duration of the war. This is just wrong. Yeah, that that this should that this should be happening. We, we need these players. We can't, when they come home, they should be allowed to do this. And we should respect the fact that they are gone. But I think, I think the, so this is, these are numbers all, all around the place. And you get cork hurlers like Flory Buckley and Harry Burgess. Burgess won Victorian, Victoria Cross. And they died fighting in, in, um, in, in the war in Europe, in the army of, in the, in the British army, in the uniform of the British army. John Cunningham, the great turless hurler, died fighting Europe for the British Army. And the list goes on of, mm. of condolences expressed to the family of GEA players who died. And probably the most striking story of them all is James Rossiter, 
Now, James Rossiter was a brilliant forward who was instrumental in Wexford winning Leicester Championships in 1913 and 1914. Indeed, he scored the winning goal very late in the 1914 Leinster final. That year, he went on and played for Wexford against Kerry, and Kerry beat Wexford in a very narrow All-Ireland final, but it was clear that Wexford were, were the coming team. Wexford come back in 1915. They blaze through Leinster. They get to the All-Ireland final. They win the All-Ireland final. But Rossiter is on the team. In fact, Rossiter is no longer alive. Alive Ten days before that All-Ireland final of, of 1915, he died from injuries sustained while fighting for the British Army in France. Yeah. And his story was the cause of enormous outpouring of grief from people who knew him and played with him in, in, in Wexford. And these are the tangles, the nuances of history that decry the later attempts by propagandists, propagandists at the time as well, but propagandists later to construct a nationalist a nationalist fairy tale around the GA's involvement in World War I. And they went on to do the same thing about GA involvement in the Rising, which you may want to talk about. Yeah, we'll come to that now. I suppose it's very difficult to ascribe motivation to all of these GA players, though, who went off. Like, if you wanted to extend the fairy tale of nationalism for the GA, you could say that the likes of a Rossiter and all the other GA players who went did so to further the likelihood of home rule. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't know, we can't say why each individual GEA player might have went. This is, this is exactly the point, Joe, and it's exactly the point, and it's why it's also, so people go and fight in the British Army, people join the RIC, and it's really easy from 100 years on to look at them and paint them in a certain light and to, to imagine that um, they did it for a particular reason or that they were a particular type of person. And it's, it's, usually, uh, an, uh, it's usually what it is, is it's history suborned to the politics of a particular time and a particular cause and a particular crusade. The idea that you would feel capable of ascribing motivations always to a whole swathe of people and to understand them as a monolithic group is entirely wrong. Okay. And history, history demands uh, a complexity and a flexibility around these things. And that may not suit current politics. And it may not suit how people wish to see the past of their own association. And there will be GEA people who still find it very hard to accept that the GEA wasn't always to the pump when it comes to fighting for Ireland or for trying to free Ireland. But that's the reality. And the yeah. evidence does not permit of any other reality. So that brings us to 1916 then. How to the front of this was the GEA or, or, or Irish sport even, but I'm yeah. primarily of the GEA. Yeah, it's really interesting. Again, the rhetoricians within the GEA would long have presented a picture whereby 1916 could not have happened without the GEA, how the GEA was to the forefront of almost all the men who fought in the GEA or fought in the, in the GPO or in, and, and in the Easter Rising um, were GEA people and that there were no, was nobody from any other sport and it just again doesn't hold water. Now, this is not to argue that there were not key members of the GEA who were central to the revolution. That's not to argue that at all. That would be a stupid argument to make. Equally, it is not true that um, the GEA were not involved at all. There were, there were, if you take it, that there were between 1,500 and 1,800 uh, rebels on Easter week, which is not an enormous amount uh, when you consider the, the size of the country. And the basic fact is that there were probably more GEA men in, there were more GEA men fighting in the Battle of the Somme in, in 1916 than there were in the GPO. But even allowing for that, about one-fifth of the rebels who went out had um, a connection with the GEA, either stronger or, or weaker. It is also the fact that Sir Matthew Nathan, um, the, the Chief Secretary in Central to Dublin Castle, the organisation of British rule in Dublin Castle, blamed the GEA as one of the main factors as to why there was a rising. Um, and the, they said the GEA was instrumental in it. So those things, those two things taken together, plus the later, you remember the great pageant, commemor pageant commemorating um, the centenary of the 1916 Rising in Crow Park in 2016. It all creates this imagery of the GA being at one with the rebels of 1916. But there are inconvenient truths to that story which do not allow you to just repeat, re repeat it like that. For example, when they heard of Sir Matthew Nathan's statement implicating the GEA in the Rising, the GEA issued a statement immediately 
from a meeting of its central council in which they said that that statement is not just untrue but also unjust. It utterly rejected the notion that it was involved in, in, in the rising. But it gets more than that. If you look at what happened in the rest of, of, of 1916, the GEA did two things. They sent a delegation to the House of Commons to meet the revenue commissioners, uh, the, the English revenue commissioners, where to ask that they be excused from paying entertainment tax, this new tax that the British government was introducing on sporting and other cultural events in order to raise money for the war effort. And the GA said, listen, we're a national pastimes organisation, we should be excused for that. So they entered into a dialogue with not just the revenue commissioners, but also General Sir John Maxwell. Now, General Sir John Maxwell was the man, the officer of the British Army, who was brought into Dublin to suppress the rising of 1916. It was Maxwell who oversaw and drove the execution of 15 rebels, uh, including Pierce and Connolly and so on, in the day across 10 days after the rising. It was Maxwell who oversaw the, the internment of almost 3,000 people in the weeks and months after the rising, including many significant GA figures. And the GA met him. And they met him and they discussed this idea of getting off the tax. They looked for a meeting and they looked for, uh, for, for use of trains in order that they could play their matches. I make these points simply to show that the construction of a narrative of being at one, if you're so at one with the rebels of 1916, how can you meet their executioner afterwards? Mm. What about through the build-up to, say, the War of Independence, Collins's War, the retaliation in Crow Park, very famously, it seemed like whether they wanted to or not, they would have been dragged into it in a more overt way. Did they start releasing statements? Like, I've never even thought, for instance, what statement might the GEA have released after the shooting of Hogan that day in Crow Park? I mean, did they, uh, did they become a bit more militant in their approach to this thing? Oh, yeah, the, the story is different. The story, the story of the War of Independence is an entirely different story than that. You get through 1917, and particularly in 1918 and 1919, the GEA was radicalised at central level. It was a radicalisation which reflected the radicalisation of wider Irish society. This is okay. something where the GEA reflects it, it didn't drive it. So you get the introduction now in 1919 of a rule which also banned from memory membership of the GA, any civil servant who took the oath of allegiance, which all civil servants did to the British Crown. This included people who had given a lifetime service to the GA. They'd spent 20, 30 years working yeah. for the association, building it up, volunteering. But now they were told to choose, choose between your job and your, and your involvement in the GA. Yeah. And that really put, it was a hugely divisive move. But the whole thing was swayed by Harry Boland, who was a central figure in the Irish Revolution and who, who stood up in Congress and was GM and stood up in Congress and said, that the GA has always owed its position to the fact that it has drawn a line between the garrison and the gale, and you must do so now. And all through this, the GA became more radicalised, in tune with Irish society. And I suppose the, great, the, the single um, most appalling event in terms of GA involvement was Bloody Sunday and what happened in November 1920 in a month that had seen increasing violence and on the morning of of Bloody Sunday, 14 um, people were shot dead by Michael Collins' um, forces in Dublin. Um, most of them, though not all, were members of the British security forces. And that afternoon, in the most appalling scenes, a united force of soldiers from the British Army, um, soldiers from the Dublin Metropolitan Police, the Royal Irish Conservatory, and uh, Royal Irish Constabulary, and um, came together and approached three, Croke Park from um, three different places. They came down Jones's Road from along where Gill's Pub is. They came at it from the end behind where the Nally Terrace is, as in down Clonniff Road. And they came at it from uh, the corner behind what is now Hill 16. So mm -hmm. they came at this from three different angles. And the, Dublin were playing Tipperary in a challenge match. And Dublin and Tipperary were the two best football teams in the country at this stage. And it is absolutely clear at this point that the GEA has been identified as being a nationalist organisation and this is the venue for revenge. And Croke Park was an entirely different ground now, or then than it was now. So, for example, the area, there was a terrace of houses where the current Hogan stand is and the ground was much more tightly packed in. 
but there were a couple of boys sitting in trees at the corner just over the canal bridge watching the game. And the first person to die in Croke Park on that day was a boy who was shot out of the tree by soldiers who were firing even as they crossed the bridge. From those initial shots, more shots came from the Hill 16, what wasn't called Hill 16 at the time. We'll talk about that next week. But that, that will, people coming in from that angle, soldiers coming in from that angle, more coming in. And in this hail of bullets, ultimately 14 people die. And if you read, you have to, well, you have to think about this in two ways. There's the cover-up, first of all, where the British Army and then the British Parliament and the British forces in Ireland and the very highest point of the British government issued a statement that the first shots came from inside the ground. And it's, it was just utterly lacking in any evidence. And, but that was the line that was taken. But this, is, this was traditional form. This is the form of the British government. It's the type of thing that was thrown out on Bloody Sunday in Derry in the early 1970s. It's thrown again and again in India for their cover-up for massacres there and so on. But as it has emerged with files that were appeared afterwards, testimony given by other officers, what happened at autopsies, it's quite clear that the shooting was indiscriminate and the great wonder is that more people did not die on, on the day uh, than, than, than did actually die. Some were killed in the stampede to get away. Some were shot, shot in the back as they ran for cover. And there was a bloodlust among some of the people who were firing guns into this place and a recklessness and a lawlessness, which was absolutely emblematic of the activities of the worst elements of the British Armed Forces in Ireland during these years. You know, you just got me thinking in a way I have never really thought before about that day because it's just billed as retaliation for the uh, shootings that Collins had ordered to be carried out the night before. And obviously they were targeted killings. I mean, violence is violence, so I'm sure people can find both abhorrent, but they were targeted killings and clearly what happened at Crow Park was indiscriminate, be it in, again, Leaving Cert History or even the Michael Collins film which a lot of people would have seen and, and it kind of brought home what happened that day to people. The cover-up is never really talked about. I mean, now that you think about it, that the army in charge of the country would indiscriminately shoot citizens is illegal, is an outrage, and even by the standards of those days would have had to have been covered up. So there was an inquiry, there was outrage, there were lies told in Westminster about what happened. Oh, yeah, so we, ha we have to think about... This I actually think that like, later in the year when we when we come to November we should do you should do a a, a show on this I mean Michael Foley is brilliant on it yeah. um, there are, there are Anne Dolan who's a Trinity College historian is superb on what happened in in the morning like the morning let's talk about the morning for a second what happened in the morning was not just a simple targeting of things. They shot also the wrong people, as well as shooting people who were operative. So there was a couple of innocent people shot in this. And right. some of the manner in which they were shot carries a cruelty, which within a war, you can dress this up any way you want, but it's cruel. It's a man hanging out a window, being shot in front of his fiance, and, and so on. And there's a, really, there's a really cruel element of this, which destroyed the lives, not just of those who were shot, obviously, who lost their lives and their relatives who survived, some of whom witnessed it, but also the killers who did the killing, who were, in several instances, utterly traumatized for the rest of their lives. And they had their own lives destroyed by the killings which they had undertaken in that morning. And Anne Dolan has documented this in a brilliant article, which, which uh, is, is, is really, worth, uh, really worth reading. That's the first thing. But in the second thing, the cover-up, the series of cover-ups which, which, which were put in place, first of all at a local level, by the army, and then by Dublin Castle, and then by London, and then the Cabinet Office, and how it continued for so long, the denial of responsibility, the blaming of the people from within inside the ground from it. It was an absolute travesty. What happened on the day was a disgrace. It will, and much worse than a disgrace. There are not words adequate to describe the scale of the indiscriminate nature of the shooting that was undertaken by the British Army when, when they came in here. But what happened afterwards is an incredible stain on the record of the British government that it should indulge in the cover-up that was undertaken afterwards. OTB. 
AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Oh, he gets out of the car and the cop said, where do you think you're going? He said, I'm looking for Joe Frazier. Where's Joe Frazier? We're bringing you an exclusive first listen of a special interview with Muhammad Ali's former business manager. Here at first this bank holiday Sunday at 7pm. OTB Sports Radio, live 24-7 on the Go Loud app. OTB AM with Aviva, Ireland's largest insurer, celebrating 10 years of iconic sporting moments at the Aviva Stadium. If you've just joined us, you've missed great stuff there from Paul Rouse talking about the fallout from uh, 1916 Bloody Sunday and the impact that it had on sport and the role that sport played in the War of Independence as well. It's part of his lecture series that you can get every Tuesday night here on Off the Ball and you can get it, of course, on the OTV Podcast Network. Just search Paul Rice off the ball. We're at, what are we at? Bang on eight o'clock. A minute past eight now this morning. Um, oh, and last night, obviously, the uh, German version of the Classico. How do you actually say it? What's the, what's the correct German? Der Klassiker. Pro- that's the correct German pronunciation, Der Klassiker. Okay, um, that's pretty easy. But nobody, nobody says that, apparently. It's a completely fabricated phrase, just almost tongue-in-cheek to say we've got our own version of El Classico. I thought so that. So we're going to... Yeah. Like... Marketing oh, right, BS. Sorry, sorry. It was, it's, it's just me who thought it was actually a legitimate thing then. Well, I was like, <laughs> how, how come it's funny this is a new... So, um, did they try and do a, a Manchester Classico for a while? Or, oh, sorry, the English Classico was uh, Man United, Liverpool. Liverpool. I mean, it's not a Classico. There's one Classico, and that's the Classico, and let's all stop losing... These games don't need the marketing. They actually don't. They're good enough. What about the, what about the Super Classico? Is, is that a legitimate one? Uh, the Super Classico is when it's for a Super Cup, is it? No, it's uh, Boca River, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Okay. I mean, did they always call that Super Classico or when did they decide this also needed marketing? Because it doesn't. No, that, that very much has the bang of a new generation Pokemon off it, where they just add a couple of syllables onto an old Pokemon just to make it a new evolution. Okay. The, the perfect analogy that went straight over my head, at least it would have done uh, three or four years ago, but now I'm like, okay, I, I get you now. I actually, I understand this again. Life comes full circle and comes at you fast, Oh, and that's the only thing I'll say. 87 9180 is the number if anybody wants to get in touch with this. I, I've got a confession to make. I was kind of looking forward to the game last night, and then I checked my Twitter feed, and it was already half time. I was like, oh, man. I forgot that it was an early kickoff. Mm. And early kickoffs are so good for us as well, like getting up early in the morning. It's an odd feeling having watched a really satisfying 90 minutes and looking at your clock, and it's like it's only 20 past 7. The night is still a baby. You don't have to go straight to bed. You can actually digest what you've watched for a little while, and it's a fantastic feeling. And it was really good, Jer. I'm not sure did you catch any of the highlights afterwards, but this whole lack of fans thing actually doesn't make that much of a difference. It makes a difference for sure because you've got two rivals going up against one another. You've got one of the best stadiums in world football, which would have provided uh, an added edge to things. But when you're watching two of the best teams in world football go toe-to-toe, you don't need fans to appreciate how good this is. All elements of it were outstanding. I actually thought Dortmund played some of the better football throughout the game, certainly started the better team. But Bayern obviously just a bit more clinical and Kimmich's goal is just, oh my God, what a what a chip goalkeeper should have got to it. But um, like it's, it's kind of one of those where you're in a little bit of disbelief because you've got the commentator telling you that this is right, but you're not quite sure if this is definitely if this has definitely happened within the rules because there is no fans to kind of guide you. And, and I wonder if that's one of the reasons why there has been such a hankering for fans is that it kind of informs us of the seriousness of things. That yeah. if there's a ball that fizzes across the box and there's silence, you're like, well, somebody's clearly been offside here. If there's a ball that fizzes off the box and there's a big cheer or a whoop from the crowd, yeah. you realise that it's actually legit. And that's what I miss. But uh, Joshua Kimmich, take a bow. It was unreal. I think um, the other thing about fans is they see people making runs, so you know they, they understand what's going to come in the next 10 seconds as opposed to what's also just happened, which you're missing out on, and they can help inform your experience, particularly because the TV cameras don't actually capture the full 360-degree mm. experience. So um, I, I guess that's to, um, to follow on, uh, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about this. Um, I, I, like, is that the league over? Is that the unfortunate part about this? I mean. Should nobody have tapped Bayern on the shoulder here and said, look, lads, you're going to win the league title eventually. Maybe you want to keep things interesting for a little while. Mm. Yeah, I saw Andy Mitten tweet last night saying the Bundesliga is a disgrace. Bayern Munich have the league wrapped up by June already. Uh, eight in a row is what it's going to be at this point. And Not they, great, they, is they, it? 
they show no signs of going anywhere. Like they have, well, even, even when it comes to the next generation, they have the better players. Like Alfonso Davis at left back is just unbelievable. If you were building a team from scratch now for the future and you could pick one left back in the world, you would pick this guy. That is, that is how good he is, even though he's still a teenager, born in November 2000, the Canadian international. But hang like, on, uh, hang on. Like, actually, Dortmund have the better collection of young players. It's just that they won't be Dortmund players this time next mm. year or the year after. Like, That's my point, sorry. is that Alfonso Davis would become a staple for Bayern Munich. Like, the way things have gone, Erling Haaland could become a staple for Bayern Munich in a couple of years. We, we just don't know this. The, when it comes to the youth of Dortmund, like we only saw uh, a second half performance from Jaden Sancho yesterday. He didn't start the game. Um, like we, we saw Reina come on for a little bit at the end, but it was mostly Haaland who, who was flying the flag for the youngsters in that Dortmund team. You just can't fully invest in the fact that they're going to be Dortmund players for the long haul. No. And I, you do, look, you wonder about the, the attractiveness that that league is going to have if Bayern keep winning season after season after season after season after season. I, this was the model that um, people would hold up when they complained about the Premier League. It's like, oh, this is a, a largely fan-owned, at least portion of every club, fan-owned league, and it's the right way to do it, and fans keep going, and the attendances are very good, and there's a sense of ownership. But actually, there's a single power that is kind of ruining the competitive integrity of the competition. And I, I almost wonder if it's going to take something like an RB Leipzig to come along and actually win a title and wrestle it away. And there's actually a third player in this because like eight is a lot. Dortmund have tried everything under the sun post Jurgen Klopp to try and get this title back. And you can't really blame them. They've gone close this season, that last season, like oh, Bamiyang's last season, sorry, which was about two seasons ago. It seems that they came relatively close and they have been knocking on the door. And maybe that's because Bayern Munich haven't been the best team in Europe over the last little while, they've just been the best team in Germany and maybe they've slipped a tad. But really, you're clutching at straws when you're trying to make that sort of argument. And it's hard to see how Dortmund make a leap forwards to actually close that gap. So they're seven points ahead at the moment. It's probably going to finish up seven or ten points as a, a title win for Bayern Munich come the end of the season. Like, uh, as you say, it would be great to be able to watch the likes of Haaland and Sancho and seeing them grow as players over the next couple of years with Dortmund because that is the only way they can close the gap. But... Once they leave, there's no guarantee that they're even going to have teenagers of that quality coming through again. So you're kind of looking at perhaps the the mega money of Red Bull maybe giving Bayern a, some bit of a challenge in the next five years. Yeah, OK. I should remind everybody, actually, the best place to get the Paul Rice podcast, it now has its own podcast stream. It's called History of Sport. So if you just search History of Sport, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, you will get it there. Um, there's a, a bunch of other things you can search for as well. If you subscribe to Highlights, we'll definitely put it up there for you as well. But History of Sport, its own podcast stream, so you can binge on the entire lecture series from one of the most articulate voices speaking about sports um, in any era in Ireland. That's Paul Rice, and we're delighted he's part of this. Uh, eight minutes past eight this morning, Shane Hannon is with us. Shane, how are you getting on? Not too bad, lads. Keeping well. Enjoying the Der Klassiker chat there. Yeah. Did you uh, imbibe some Der Klassiker last night? Watch the highlights back. Um, beautiful chip. And yeah, it's still eerie not having the crowd. But um, yeah, I'm kind of along the same lines. I find it hard to feel the vibe of this as a classic, given that uh, Dortmund sell all their players to Bayern. Um, I know a lot of people in Germany as well. I think Dortmund Schalke is actually the real, the real derby in the Bundesliga. Mm. Um, and I guess Bayern probably have more of a rivalry with the, the Bavarian teams like Nuremberg and whatever else but it feels like a bit of a faux classic a bit of a forced derby if you like Yeah, it, just on the thing of the, the fans chain it was interesting, BT Sport obviously they went a cappella last night just commentators and sounds of the players Fox Sport won in the United States went for fake crowd sounds so depending on your country that's, uh, that's how you're going to experience the Bundesliga well, of course, the Americans went with fake noises and extra little sound bites. They kind of tend to do that, but uh, maybe it adds to it. I don't know. It it probably has a bit bit of a weird vibe to it, but whatever adds to the entertainment value, I guess. But uh, if it's it's kind of nice hearing the players shout, hearing the manager scream as well. Can you do both? Um, Can you is the crowd noise the fake crowd noise so loud that you can't hear? what's going on, or do they boost those mics so you can hear that and also you hear crowd noise? I don't know. I haven't seen the American one. No, you can't, you can't really hear anything in, in the pitch uh, going on whatsoever. Like one of the things that's kind of noticeable without the fake crowd noise is just you're hearing every stroke of the ball. Like maybe if there's like a very weak pass around the middle of the park away from the microphones, 
you don't hear it, but just I, I don't know, it's just something that you you, you hear maybe uh, you hear maybe five percent of the the really tough efforts during a packed stadium game. Here you're hearing every little touch with a, an empty stadium, and that that definitely adds to it. It's kind of like when you're watching the UFC when they were in Florida a couple of weeks ago, that you could hear every punch connect with the skin. It's not really on the same level, but you could you can hear boot connecting with ball, which is kind of a, a nice aural sensation. But no, you can't hear anything when Fox Sports are pumping in fake crowd noises. Okay, so have you decided which is your preferred one just yet? I don't know to be honest, because last night was the first time I actually kind of picked up on the extra, the, the, how, what the silence brings. And as Phil was saying the other day, let's have this when the Premier League comes back, and let's hope we can pick up some English happening on the pitch that's actually quite funny. And then we've got a product. Uh, the, the, I mean, really, the Premier League should get somebody to sign Wayne Rooney immediately and <laughs> allow him to be parachuted into the league just for the sake of what he would say over the final seven or eight weeks of the condensed season. Because I think that would be amazing. I think that would actually, we would all be watching. You know, you could stick everything on delay by one minute so it's somebody's job to pull the fader down. Back up, down, back up, down, back up, down, up. I mean, we all see the players covering their mouths at the end of games, trying to keep the lip readers at bay. But I guess now they have to also be extremely quiet when they're talking to Whisper. rival players after a match. Whisper shout. Because we can all hear what they're saying. Like your man, Mass, back in the day. Well, like, yeah, I, I, I was kind of considering that, that like you could easily put like microphones on there. You could you could sneak them into their masks, their protective masks, and they wouldn't know a thing. Um, it's like, like it is interesting looking at the, the variation of masks being used in a game like uh, some of the coaches had proper industrial style masks one of the Bayern Munich coaches just had a a Bayern Munich crested one I saw at Arsenal training yesterday Mikel Arteta had an Adidas one and those Adidas masks the regular black ones are now sold out online you couldn't buy a single one yesterday if you looked to buy one they're flying off the shelves and we have this whole new brand of marketing if David Beckham was a footballer today he would be sporting the coolest mask on the return to play of the Premier League I dare say has anyone thought of the GA face mask yet? I, know, I saw someone had a Galway one. I don't know if it was a GA specific, but it was a Galway themed mask. But there, there could be a market there for, for Gaelic masks. I'd buy a Monaghan mask for sure. I, I presume it's close to existing already, Shane. Yeah, someone has to have thought of that. I mean, I can't, imagine. I can't believe you've just given this amazing business way idea at the time where we're on the, the precipice of the greatest depression since the or Great Depression. And uh, you've just given it away for nothing, Shane. <laughs> Copyright. Yeah. What, what have you got for us this morning? Yeah, we'll kick off with uh, the Premier League lads. Uh, clubs expected back uh, in the latest phase of Project Restart today, which will allow players resume contact training in groups of up to 12. Uh, so far, players have had to socially distance since returning to the training pitches last week. Uh, on Monday, of course, this week, the UK government approved groups of up to three players resuming tackling. Uh, there could be a bonanza in store for TV viewers as well. Matches potentially being staggered across five time slots on Saturdays and Sundays if and when the season resumes at the end of June. It's possible matches will be staged at noon, 2pm, 4pm, 6pm and 8pm on a Saturday and a Sunday and played at 6pm and 8pm in midweek. There is a likelihood that some games will be free to air. Meanwhile, the takeover of Newcastle United by a fund backed by the government of Saudi Arabia could be in doubt after the World Trade Organization found that the state was involved in the legal streaming of Premier League games, a link the Saudis deny. Uh, on Bundesliga matters then, Bayern, as we said, have gone seven points clear at the top of the Bundesliga. Joshua Kimmich goal gave them a 1-0 win behind closed doors away to closest rivals Borussia Dortmund last night. That win has left Bayern firmly on course for, as we said, an eighth German league title in a row. Borussia Mönchengladbach moved into the Champions League places after their nil-all draw with Werder Bremen. Wolfsburg beat Bayer Leverkusen by four goals to one while it was a three-all thriller between Frankfurt and Freiburg in the other game last night. Uh, the SPFL will consider Hart's proposal to change the structure of the Scottish leagues later today. Uh, they are set to be relegated to the Championship following the early end of the Premiership campaign. So they submitted their plans last night. Hearts are requesting a temporary switch to three 14 club divisions for the next two years. And Aberdeen do say they will back that plan. Uh, rugby news, London Irish player Sean O'Brien believes rugby will be one of the last sports to return in the UK because of the coronavirus. Meanwhile, Munster have paused their season ticket scheme for the 2020-21 campaign 
as rugby counts the cost of the pandemic. The former CEO of the English Rugby Football Union, Francis Barron, has proposed a one-off tournament involving all world nations in Britain and Ireland in June or July of next year that would help raise funds for global unions. Uh, to horse racing, there have been a total of 369 entries submitted for the return of racing in the UK at, at uh, Newcastle next Monday. Only 120 runners will be permitted, though, on the day. Uh, Lee Westwood is optimistic the European Tour golf season will resume in July at the British Masters. The Englishman is due to host the tournament at Close House. So far, 17 competitions have been cancelled or indeed postponed because of COVID-19. Uh, Manchester United boss Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wants to extend Odin Agallo's loan spell at the club. The striker is due to return to his club in China at the end of the month, and that had been the word uh, over the last week or so. But with the English season being extended, Solskjaer says he is eager to keep Igalo at Old Trafford for longer. United fans as well might be interested in Pat Nevin's take on offtheball.com as well. This morning, he's pitting... Uh, Roy Keane against Stephen Gerrard. That article is up on offtheball.com. He was on the show last night. Uh, he says they were so core to their team, but there was a period when Stevie G was the team. So you can read why he thinks Stephen Gerrard was better than Roy Keane on offtheball.com. He's right He's right that uh, Stephen Gerrard was the team. That team was a rubbish team compared to the team that was made better by Roy Keane. Like, mm. That's the thing. Uh, Gerard was a really good player. He, he said something else very interesting. If I wanted to win a game, I'd pick Roy Keane. If I needed mm. to win a game, I'd pick Roy Keane, which is kind of the whole point of um, being a manager. In you know, So if you're Alex Ferguson, you're going to pick Roy Keane over Stevie G. If that's your choice, and it's a, obviously that choice never really exists because they could mm. absolutely play together. But um, And I also I understand when you're picking these teams, you, like, you pick the player who thrilled you the most. And Steven Gerrard was a pretty thrilling player for you know, very large portions of many games, but also, you know, not as consistent as uh, Roy Keane and not as much of a winner as Roy Keane. Could, could I, just one question here, which is that that's a kind of worms which should be opening at 16 minutes past eight on a Wednesday morning. But if we, if we did a straight swap of Roy Keane for Frank Lampard, would that have been the most mutually beneficial trade between the Republic of Ireland and England ever, given that Saipan still exists and we would have had Frank Lampard potentially driving us on. And instead of the Gerrard versus Lampard situation that England had to find themselves in constantly, they could have had Gerrard and Keane. As you say, Ger, could have played together perfectly. Sorry, you, you England would have won like three World Cups. What are you talking about? This is <laughs> like the we, most and we, and we heresy, best, idiotic thing you've just done. You've, playing you've, for us. We would have had our best player playing for us in, uh, in France. Because my, and we would have gone out in the quarterfinals. What are you talking about? I would 100% take going out in the quarterfinals instead of the only the only World Cup memory Shane and I have, Jerry, is going out in the last 16. We've never seen Roy Keane play in a World Cup. <laughs> yeah, it's a fair point. England would have won the, the World Cup, oh, and you've just gifted them, like, you've just given them the single thing they missed, heart and passing from central midfield. Well, they, all, they almost did it with Jordan Henderson and... I, I, exactly! I, exactly! They won three World Cups in a row. What are you talking about? It'd be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Good point. Worst, oh, like, I didn't worst really idea ever. Like worst idea that, ever. We would, we would have got an extra... We probably would have qualified for one extra World Cup, and I'm all for that. This is almost as bad as you saying that uh, we had an Irish winner of the uh, British Open overseas last year when <laughs> Shane Larry won in Portrush. Almost, almost. Not, not a direct quote, but it was something along those lines. I'm an imperialist at heart. Yeah, <laughs> he, he went abroad. He crossed... He crossed the seas to Port Rush. <laughs> he brought he brought the sour chug home. How did it get through, uh, Customs. through the security at the airport? Um, I, I see Harder Midlothian are pulling the old uh, Team Thirty Three, except it's Team Fourteen. That's their that's their play, right? Yeah, the fact that Aberdeen are backing them is quite interesting as well. Um, look, it's a bit ridiculous and it's a bit pathetic, just like the Team Thirty Three argument when Henri did the ham, that handball, but. I guess it's financially very, very unstable for them if they get relegated to the championship. So look, you can't, you can't help them for, uh, for trying at least. This is a more legitimate. This is definitely a more legitimate uh, yeah. way of like you're relegating us when we actually had could have had enough games left to get out of relegation, even though they were playing really bad. Uh, right, are you done, Shane? Is that enough? Yeah, all good. Cheers, Jack. Nice one. Thanks a million. That's uh, Shane Hannon with us there, giving us an update on what's happening around the world of sport. Here's what's coming up on the show for you this morning: a brilliant Jacob Stockdale interview coming your way. At around about 8.35 this morning, Kieran Sheehan's going to join us. He's um, involved in a fundraiser with Cork GAA for Pieta House. Going to talk to us about um, what life in lockdown has been like for him. Just back from Australia, obviously. 
and uh, was say, back in the Cork team having come back from Australia. And then Gavin James joins us for the OTB Culture Hall of Fame. He's putting Back to the Future in. Oh, and one of the things that we didn't realise was that you are a complete Back to the Future nerd. This is like, oh. this is just behind the US office or is it right there with the US office? Well, in, in terms of cinema, it's it could probably be my third favourite movie of all time. It's possibly top three. I'm, it, and I, it, I would be confident enough to say it makes my Mount Rushmore of my favorite movies. What else it's just is there? In, in, in there behind The Departed and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Back to the Future could be in there in terms of movies that I enjoy the most, that I find so rewatchable. Love this. I can't remember, like, I'm trying to think what age I would have been when I first watched it. I, I, I would say that the movie was about 12, 15 years old when I first laid eyes on it. And, oh my God, I was like, this is the best concept ever. This is brilliant. I cannot wait for the year 2015 when it eventually comes around because it looks amazing. I'm going to be. I'm going to have a hoverboard in the year 2015. It gave you hope. It had a great story. It had brilliant acting. It's funny. Uh, like Back to the Future Three is crap. Let's face it. But the first two, fantastic. Uh, like uh, I, I don't have uh, the words to to describe how much I love Back to the Future. Right. Okay. Well, you get a chance to um, explain it all to Gavin James a little bit later on, and he will share in that love as well. Time now for the uh, sports pages. OCB AM. We'll start with offthewall.com, and that's John Gonzalez from last night. Steve Kerr has done nothing in professional basketball but win. He's um, grown a beard. That's obviously a picture of him from the uh, screen grab from The Last Dance from his time with the Bulls, and um, I guess that's him as the Warriors coach. That's the Warriors logo, uh, where obviously he has overseen a bit of a revolution with um, Steph Curry. Uh, debunking the GEA's self-made myths of 1916 and the Great War. Um, some brilliant stuff from Paul Rouse pointing out that there were more GA members at the Battle of the Somme than there were in 1916 in the Rising and the uh, mythology that comes from that. And rugby, nice bit of niggle. Brian O'Driscoll's worst team to lose to. It's not England, it's Wales. Spoiler alert. Tyler Hamilton spat in the soup, the omerta in pro cycling. A brilliant interview yesterday with Tyler Hamilton where he just started to open up about the repercussions of telling the truth and how really Lance Armstrong is not telling the truth just yet. He's telling a partial truth, which is kind of worse than... Um, you know, even not telling any truth. And then Pat Nevin talking about why he prefers Stevie G to Roy Keane up there with the best I've ever seen, which is high praise. And Pat Nevin knows a thing or two about football. So um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to dismiss that this morning. There'll be a lot of war breaking out on uh, keyboards um, from bedrooms and on phones uh, right around these islands. But sure, look, we'll see what happens. The back page of the Irish Independent this morning features a photograph of a flailing Roman Berkey as Joshua Kimmich scores that goal to chip Bayern Munich into a 1-0 lead and probably the Bundesliga title last night. The main story here, though, league players to grill Quinn over a return to play impasse, writes Dan McDonnell. Interim FAI CEO faces questions arising from slow progress in attempts to convince clubs. So Quinn's going to meet with a delegation of League of Ireland players this Friday and they're going to discuss the concerns around the delay to finalising a plan for a return to football. So obviously, the vast majority of these clubs garner a huge amount of their revenue from people coming through turnstiles and paying to go see them play football. That hasn't uh, been an opportunity. That hasn't been a financial opportunity for them in recent weeks. It won't be a financial opportunity for them for quite some time. So now Quinn and the FAI are trying to come up with ways to make up for that and to, to make it financially sensible for them to, to go back to play because obviously otherwise some of these players will need to find other jobs um, or will need to sign up for the 350 quid a week or whatever it may be. But they're in a bit of an impasse at the moment. Will they actually be in a safe space to actually earn their money again as footballers. Uh, so now Quinn going to be put under the pump by some of the players and some of the League of Ireland representatives later on this week. And then Martin Bretney, Ulster's Captain Marvel's lead by example in top 20 rankings. So Martin Bretney going through his top 20 players of the last 50 years in Ulster this morning in both hurling and football. Peter Canavan, Michael Murphy and Kieran McGeady all featuring near the top of their respective lists. Did he do, um, did he do, who did Kerry, what was the Kerry situation? The Kerry, who was number one? Yeah. Jack O'Shea. Jack O'Shea's number one. Who's number two? Pat Spillane. Right, okay. Is that putting a bit of pressure on you for your uh, Kerry Mount Rushmore, which is what, a month away? Three weeks away? Like five, four days away. Oh, you're doing it on Monday. I'm missing it. Right. So this Tuesday, is. Tuesday, yeah. Oh, right. So this is your weekend of hell. Yeah, I have a. I have a. Did the mafia. I had it, did the mafia. I had it made up. No, you're doing it. Have you it alerted them to the fact that. Because they're going to start picking at you now. They're going to start to sliding them. into your DMs. I need, I need to mobilise them soon and tell them to like set up 
uh, Kerry Mafia, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and get those handles on Twitter now so that they can back me up. Or I might just set them up myself, those handles, and come to bat for myself come next Tuesday because it is going to be war. Let's just say if it was me versus Martin Brettany on my Mount Rushmore, we would have two very different looking mountains. Right. Jack O'Shea better be honest. That's all I'm saying. We, we could have put him on Kildare's actually, given that Kildare made him who he is because he's been living there for most of his life. Uh, the Irish Times sports section today, Munster braced for worst of financial crisis. Uh, Gavin Comiskey is wondering what impact the debt repayments for Tolman Park are going to eventually have on Johan van Grant's playing squad. That's the same picture that Owen's been talking about. Saudi Newcastle takeover in serious doubt. Uh, Bayern victory, the only familiar part of their classicer. Uh, this is Sean Ingle's story. The controversial 300 million Saudi Arabia funded takeover of Mike Ashley's Newcastle appears to be in serious doubt after the World Trade Organization ruled that the country is behind a pirate satellite TV and streaming service that offers illegal access to sporting events. So this was the, the issue that was raised recently um, as a means of trying to stop the deal. Um, the final report won't be published until mid-June and it's understood the independent ruling family establishes Sorry, the independent ruling firmly establishes that the Saudi government is behind B out Q, which is obviously um, a, a pirate method of getting um, football piped into your home. So, not a great look for an owner of one of the Premier League clubs to be uh, offering a way for one of the broadcasters' products to be pirated, who's a partner of the Premier League. So this is going to cause a little, a little bit of an issue around the boardroom table. Perhaps it's the type of thing that um, you can use as a bargaining chip. Well, obviously, this can go away if we're allowed to buy this thing. So let's wait and see exactly how the politics of this plays out. Sa Saudi getting done for illegal streaming boxes is like Al Capone getting done for tax evasion. That this is the thing that uh, alerts the authorities in the first place. It's like, it, it does seem like it's going to become a legitimate stumbling block. Look, it, it will be interesting to see. I mean, you would have thought that loads of different stumbling blocks for other owners in the past might have prevented them from getting a handle, a hold of clubs, but that hasn't been the case. There has been no willingness on the part of the owners of the other clubs to say, yeah, oh, you can't do that, because then it's like, you know. And oh, the other thing is, <clears throat> a lot of the other clubs probably want to sell to Saudi-backed businesses or Saudi-related businesses or other uh, businesses which have, which are effectively fronts for uh, for sovereign states to, to try and buy them. And if you suddenly introduce this, they're going to say, well, it, it, it lowers the value of all those clubs and those assets. And traditionally, um, people who own a lot of stuff want the value of that to go up. And they tend to vote uh, in a manner which will allow that to happen. So it will be interesting to see if somebody else can, st can step in and stop it. Like the British government who are, you know, obviously so well run and uh, so on top of their brief at the moment that um, stepping in, I, I, look, I'm, and maybe this is an opportunity for them to get some positive publicity with a lot of the country, with the exception of the city of Newcastle. Absolutely. Uh, back page of the Irish Examiner, or the front page of their sports section, I should say. GEA must reopen pitches to protect well-being of young people. This is former Mayo and Galway boss John O'Mahony, who's saying the GEA should bring forward the date to open their young pitches, their GEA pitches, I should say, for young people. There are some suggestions that the GEA are looking into potentially bringing forward that date from July 20th to the end of next month. But that's very much TVC at the moment. Uh, Moran, meanwhile, never believed Kerry's golden ear years could be eclipsed. This is Kevin Moran, who's been speaking over the last couple of days, saying that uh, the Kerry four in a row team, he thought they would be the best of all time until, of course, the Dubs did five in a row. McElroy doubts over Ryder Cup this year, meanwhile. And Cheltenham and Liverpool game uh, increased suffering, says a report that came out yesterday. I would have thought that golf was more likely to play something like the Ryder Cup this year on the back of the fact that, that it's coming back very soon. No? Rory obviously wants to wait and play it in front of fans, but um, I felt to me that the mood around golf was way more upbeat than Rory suggested in his interview with the BBC yesterday. So did I actually. Like we, it's been the sport that we've watched over the last couple of years. Rory, or the last couple of weeks, Rory himself obviously played the, the Sunday before last. He obviously just sees that fans are a pretty big thing when it comes to the Ryder Cup. And I guess, like everything else, the Ryder Cup has its own commercial requirements as well. And getting people to actually buy tickets to the Ryder Cup is an important thing too. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't have the Herald there. If we've got a screen grab, we'll stick it up for you, and I'll tell you what's on the back of it. But um, I didn't get one in today, so. 
Uh, if we don't have that, we can move on. The London Times is next if we don't have that. Players drop concerns over full training is the headline on the back of the London Times. GPS tracking may help fight spread of infection. So the Premier League project restart set to receive a significant boost today with all 20 clubs agreeing to return to full contact training. So they're away with it really at this point, as we see a photograph there of Robert Lewandowski celebrating as Bayern Munich win last night. Test fear stalls rugby's return. Meanwhile, professional rugby union in England cannot return to play until it has answered the multi-million dollar question of what to do if a player tests positive for COVID-19, a senior executive has said. And 369 entries for first race meet. There will be a lot of disappointed owners when the final fields are made known for the return of British racing after a bumper 369 entries were submitted for the card at Newcastle on Monday. That'll be the first meeting in the UK that'll take place since March 17th. The uh, Irish Sun, hand game. Cop, Captain Stars now feel safe to play again. So Jordan Henderson said, yeah, let's go. He's obviously been in that captain's WhatsApp group. And clubs give go-ahead for phase two training. So, you know, we're, we're getting there. Fox in the box, no, it's not a giant paddling pool at Leicester. Jamie Vardy is just doing one-touch training by himself. The Fox has found a new way to social distance, but defenders should not make a habit of leaving Vardy alone in the box when football returns. See what they did there, because he likes to score. Uh, let Odeon dream on, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer says... Odin Gallo should complete his Manchester United dream and turn down the 72 million that he's been offered to go back to China. Take the money, Odin, take the money, because it's going to be a long life and you have to live it. Uh, let's do it twice in one night. They're talking about football, Owen, don't worry. Uh, Premier League bosses could adopt Champions League style kickoff times, meaning fans could watch two games in one evening. Or five games at the weekend was what one of the other uh, newspapers was suggesting. Sorry, five games in one day on a Saturday mm. and five games in one day on a Sunday. That'll be a lot of football. It is a lot. It is the lead on the back of the mirror as well here. Netflix is their headline. It's a perfect 10 for armchair fans as live television bonanza will screen five back-to-back Prem games every Saturday and Sunday. Like some variation of this should have been what the Premier League were doing anyway for the last few years. Like they're given the appetite that people have for football and the success that the television rights have been in terms of the, the cost of them going up and up and up, if you want to call that success. It's a wonder that they haven't managed to maneuver some sort of political loophole to actually get this three o'clock blackout lifted in the UK or actually go to eight o'clock kickoffs on a Saturday night sooner than they did. Like that only happened within the last 18 months, really. This really has the bang of a a World Cup Saturday or Sunday off in the group stages, having these sort of four games, five games on this occasion on one day. A lot of them uh, people might not be interested in, but like... They should be there and available for people. I I think that the idea that there's a lot of Premier League games that are very, very difficult to watch in full, I I think is actually a little bit of a shock at the moment, given how far the sport has come and how ridiculously commercial it is. It's just that it's on too many nights, right? And there are a lot of games over the course of the season. So you, you kind of try and compare it with other sports around the world. Like, you know exactly when there's NFL. There's one game on the Monday, there's one game on the Thursday, and then everything else is on the Sunday. And there's three... Essentially, three staggered kickoff times, as in five past nine and twenty past nine kickoff, but that kind of largely irrelevant. With football, you could have a Monday night game. Certain weeks there are Tuesday, Wednesday night games. There are Friday night games. There are Saturday evening games. There are Saturday afternoon games. There are Saturday early kickoffs, which there used to be. There are Sunday kickoffs at three different times, depending on policing arrangements. It's like mm. it's hard to know when you're supposed to be tuning in to the big game. I guess that's up to yourself. To I don't think that's like really the problem for the Premier League. I think the, if you're running the Premier League, you want to get as much exposure as possible at all these different times rather than having this clump of fixtures at three o'clock unless you have a fa- fantastic uh, television product like Red Zone that could go out uh, at three o'clock on a Saturday. Obviously, for political reasons, they can't do that at the moment. But like on the NFL, if you're an American football fan, you could spend your entire Saturday watching college football, and they're even more staggered than the three days of the Premier League, or the, the three fixtures of the, the NFL, I should say. And then if you throw in a London fixture, like they've got four in a day as well. Like it, it has always struck me that if you are a proper NFL fan and you are living in the United States when the time zone suits you, you will sit down at one o'clock in the afternoon and you basically don't get up until 10 o'clock at night. That is what the Premier League are now going to give us the option to do on Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah, I, 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 you do wonder, though, if actually in future, if they were to move to a five o'clock kickoff on a Saturday afternoon, you could have that red zone 
our six o'clock kickoff on a Saturday evening. Yeah, why have they done that already? That's well, like, well, what like what's been the, the fans, issue behind that? I wonder. Fans traveling, traveling fans, yeah. and their inability to get back from uh, from Watford to Newcastle. If that game kicks off the fringes of London at five o'clock, it finishes at seven. You get back to Newcastle at like three in the morning, um, and. Or do they even run trains? I don't know. Like I suppose that that has been the issue. But suddenly the fans are going to find themselves on the outside for the next 12, 18 months, and the, the game's going to change fairly significantly as a result of that. And will it change back? Is the question? Well, uh, no. There's a mm. there's a good opportunity here, which the the businesses are likely to seize to radically alter that and put the fan further down the totem pole than they've already fallen. Daily Mail for you a Eurovision. Europe shows the way as GEA plots final countdown. This is a story from Mark Gallagher saying that uh, Croke Park officials are in close contact with continental GEA clubs who've resumed training, trying to find a pathway for a return in Ireland. My friend died from COVID after Cheltenham. This is a story from Jessica Harrington who's saying that um, one of her friends actually attended uh, Cheltenham and passed away from the illness having uh, got it there. Um, she says, it was what it was. The English government said it could go ahead so then it was up to individuals to make a decision. We've got to have a bit of self-responsibility. Hindsight is great. If we knew what we know now about the virus, a lot more people probably wouldn't have gone. Maybe they shouldn't have run the festival, but they did and it's done. And we can't go back and say, oh, we shouldn't have done this or they should have got a lot of criticism. I think they got a fair amount of criticism at the time. We certainly were talking about the fact that this should be behind closed doors every day. Um, and the fact that it wasn't uh, was a pall over the entire thing. Like, certainly when those crowd pictures were emerging, everyone was like, is this really what should happen? Uh, it was the same with the Liverpool Atletico game at the time as well. Mm. Feels like an absolute, even a week later, it, it kind of felt like a, a different world at that point. Um, back page of the Irish Daily Star this morning is Batch of the Day. Fans to feast on five Teddy Prem games a day. Officials pushing to make games free to air. Uh, you've got a picture there as well of the empty stadium in Dortmund last night and Rory can't see Ryder, as you've mentioned, that uh, Rory McIlroy, hugely uncertain that the, the Ryder Cup will go ahead this year. Um, okay, so, sorry, what did you just do there? That was the Irish Daily Star. Okay, so the Telegraph is next for me. We can stick that up. I don't have it. I don't have it. I do have it. I do have it. Give me a second here. Talk amongst yourselves. Don't worry about it. At 8.37 a.m. this morning, 0879-180-180 is the number. Uh, clubs to use COVID-19 warning system. Colour-coded method will alert sides to training risks. Premier League teams to resume contact sessions. And there's uh, Jamie Vardy on his own. Uh, and um, filed reverse decision to pull plug on women's team, which is uh, a story about ASC filed. Virus Cup could raise 250 million. So the Rugby Football Union has been urged to back radical plans for a World Cup-style tournament in the United Kingdom and Ireland next summer, which could raise up to 250 million to ease the financial crisis facing the game. Proposals for a 16-team invitational tournament to be held in June and July next year have been submitted to World Rugby and the RFU with a working title of the Coronavirus Cup of World Rugby. The plan, drawn up by Francis Barron, the former RFU chief executive, is based on the 2015 World Cup in England but would involve playing matches at the national stadiums of each of the four home unions. That would be us. The uh, tournament involving 31 matches over six weeks would mean the postponement of the Lions tour to the following summer to minimise this disruption. And uh, it'd be a chance for us to win a World Cup. This is, it sounds like a win-win. Are we in? We're in. Any chance to win a World Cup, we're absolutely in. If it's a no tackling, no scrums World Cup and we win it, it counts. Any World Cup will do. He obviously knows the figures uh, fairly intimately and says that the 2015 World Cup generated net profits for the game of around 400 million. He thinks this could generate a net profit for distribution to unions of 200 to 250 million. This would be in addition to the 80 million that World Rugby has already put in place. And so uh, the draft of the tournament, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, Japan, England, France, Wales, Scotland, Italy, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, United States, Canada and Ireland. I'm just really impressed by your pronunciation of Samoa there. I've been, I've been working on it. I like the sound of it. Is there, are, are you, are you pro or, or against it on first reading? I mean, it's like, it's so wild that uh, it sounds a bit more entertaining than uh, Six Nations finishing 
another Six Nations before Christmas, yeah. and then a back-to-back -back home and away Six Nations in um, March, April. Like that's a lot Who of Six about Nations. That? Who cares about that? Really, it's like, yeah, especially if there's going to be a new one next year, like right off the Six Nations, like by all means, right off the hammering that Ireland got in Twickenham as well. If, no, if no, finish, 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 finish the season off. Like, but if you if you had this to look forward to, it'd be quite a quite a good thing to look forward to. And with national teams, you can you can have your bio bubble if you need it. If, like, I'm hopefully by that stage we won't need any bio bubbles. Um, but so we're talking summer of 2021, a random. World Cup in the middle of the whole thing. Do you give Do you give a replica trophy out, and do you say, "Sorry, South Africa, you have to defend this," or are you like, "Look, it's just a world tournament. There's a, a one-off piece of water for crystal that we've specially commissioned for this." But it's it, it can't be the Webella trophy because it is called the COVID Cup. Like it would have to be in the emblem of the coronavirus thing, you know, with the the red, the red and green, and that will have to be made out of metal. Maybe out of war for Crystal, actually, and uh, hands it to the winner. And it's just once off, and then they keep it forever, really. Can we have the final that's... in in Dublin? I mean, like, if you give us the final in Dublin, we're on board. Absolutely, absolutely. As long as it's not Cardiff, says you. Anywhere but Cardiff. Right. So that's the Telegraph. Right. Finally, or second last one for me, I should say, Guardian this morning leads with that story that you mentioned about the Saudi takeover of Newcastle in serious doubt after the WTO ruling and clubs ready to vote for contact training return. And that's the Premier League. The Irish News next. Uh, lockdown could turn the screw on Dublin veterans. McGuigan, this is Brian McGuigan, I think. Um, yeah, yesterday, Declan Darcy was in the paper saying this rest for their bodies is going to be good. Um, Brian McGuigan reckons, uh, you know, some of them might just tip over into uh, not being available anymore. And that, look, I think it's probably going to be the case for some of them that this rest is good and for others it's going to be the the off-season that was just one off-season too many for them. The back page of Ass this morning features Gareth Bale back at it, back on the golf course. Golf, golf, goal. I presume that that is uh, the easiest tra easiest translated page in the history of uh, Ass right there. So uh, will he be scoring goals as well as playing golf? I presume is what they're asking us this morning. Uh, Joe Conroy is asking us, who would you want to see in the Euro golf event Mic'd up, like Brady and Mickelson versus Manning and Tiger. Like Ronaldo, right? And uh, after that, I don't know. You can't put Messi because he's so quiet. Um, but Ronaldo's vanity would have him stitched so tightly into his trousers that he also burst. <laughs> what about Wayne Rooney, as you mentioned? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Wayne Rooney, just like good, good patter. Wayne Rooney and Roy Keane, because Roy Keane's not very good at golf, apparently, and, and doesn't like it. And so him fuming around the course throwing his golf clubs into the lake in the seventh hole and then sheepishly having to fish them out. The camera, like, just just about capturing him on the, on the fringe. Too, too scared to get too close to him, but also knowing full well that this is the money shot that's going to make your entire career as, like, keen John Van de Velle style folds up carefully the rolls at the bottom of his trousers. Mm. And uh, that that would be the party image we have of of Roy Keane. And who would be the professionals that they would play with? Is it Rory and John Ram? Uh, Larry, Larry and Rory, right? Like, let's Larry have a bit of crack here. Come on. Okay, so they, let let's kick Wayne Rooney out of it. Let's make it an all Irish one. No, Rory. Wayne Rooney's sure Wayne Rooney's granny he's was Irish. Irish. Yeah, he's Irish, Grant. Yeah, the big, big Irish head in him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it. Sorted. Uh, Roy Keane and. Yeah, Roy Keane and uh, Rory McIlroy against Shane Lowry and Wayne Rooney. Uh, look, it's perfect. I think that, I actually think that you could make that happen. Although, the two lads are in the States at the moment. If, um, if they were hunkering down in this part of the world, we could have got that off the ground. We're way over time here. If anybody has uh, any better ideas for us, 087-918-180 is the WhatsApp number. Of course, you can get us on Twitter. Uh, use the hashtag OTBAM. All right, all this week, Aviva, Ireland's largest insurer, is marking the 10-year anniversary of the official opening of the Aviva Stadium and its proud long-term sponsorship of the iconic venue. To celebrate this milestone, Aviva have been paying tribute to some of the most iconic sporting moments of the past decade. Last week, we went through the football moments. Former Sligo Rovers goalkeeper Kieran Kelly won it out with his four consecutive saves in a penalty shootout in the FAI Cup final. This week, we've been looking at the greatest rugby moments of the decade in the Aviva Stadium. We want you to join in. You can follow Aviva Ireland on Instagram and on Twitter. 
and share your favorite Aviva Stadium memories using the hashtag safe to dream Rugby's greatest moments in the Aviva Stadium. The Wednesday semi-final is going to be Robbie Henshaw's try against England versus Ryan Crotty's try in 2013. And it's currently 50-50. Uh, in that one. So Henshaw's try against England in 2015 versus Ryan Crotty's All Blacks try in 2013. I have a feeling a lot of uh, GA folk are voting for Ryan Crotty. I think that's what's happening here. And then Thursday semi-final is going to be Jacob Stockdale's try against Brian O'Driscoll breaking the try record against England. So that was the Six Nations try record. He obviously went on to score loads more as well. So uh, Stockdale's try against the All Blacks. Yesterday afternoon Owen got a chance to sit down with the Ireland and Ulster star Jacob Stockdale. Really good chat. We're going to talk here about that historic win against New Zealand in Dublin and what he's been doing in lockdown as he looks to re rediscover his best form. Enjoy. OK, so we are looking back at some of the best moments over the last decade at the Aviva Stadium. It is rugby week, so obviously Ireland against the All Blacks in 2018 has come up and the man who scored a try that night, Jacob Stockdale, is with us. Jacob, you're very welcome. How are you getting on? Cheers, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, you know, it's going all right, not too bad. Um, bit of a weird time at the moment, but yeah, I think I'm enjoying it. Before we do a deep dive on whether or not the haircut was a success or not, we should uh, chat about uh, this night at the Aviva 2018. This is the night, really, at, at the Aviva from a rugby perspective, isn't it? And I'm sure that when you look back on it, you probably think, first of all, of how unbelievable that atmosphere was on that occasion. Yeah, like, it's... The Viva, I think, is, is 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 quite a special stadium in the sense that, like, it's not you know necessarily the biggest. Like, you know, you don't have the the, the most amount of seats in comparison to somewhere like, you know, uh, Twickenham or Stade de France, like those like massive arenas. But like, the noise that can be generated, um, you know, in that stadium is incredible. And uh, yeah, that night I remember like it really went to the next level where it was like. You know, every time you like, caught a high ball, you got like the hairs in your neck were standing up just because like the, the sheer noise of the crowd, like it was, it was class. The high balls, the hits, on but like I think was it uh, James Ryan sent Brody Retallick back about fifteen meters deep into the second half, and the place just absolutely erupted. I've never seen every single incident involve the crowd so much. Yeah, that, like that's exactly it. Like you felt like you felt like you were hitting a rock and people were going wild. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, usually, that's usually stuff that nobody cares about. But yeah, just on that night, I think I think mainly because the game had been talked up so much. Like I remember, you know, in like the start, the first game of the season, like with Ulster, playing with them. And afterwards, I, was, I got interviewed and they were like, right, well, what about this New Zealand game in November? That's like, right. you know, that's about, that's about three months away. But like, you know, people, like they were just ready for it. And, um, yeah, it was when it finally came around. I think like, everybody was just so worked up about it. Like that's where the noise came from. What was the bigger factor going into this game, Jacob? Was it the fact that you'd finally got the job done against the All Blacks, and that it gave a greater sense of confidence going in, given everything that had happened in Chicago two years previous, or was it actually more to do with the fact that there had been a couple of really near misses in Dublin over the past few years? Um, <clears throat> I don't really know because. Like, because this was my first, that, like, that was my first time playing them. So, I suppose for me, I was just focusing on my game and, and like, just trying to have as good a performance as I could, like, in, you know, what was probably the biggest game of my life to that point. Um, so, like, for me, I was just focused on that game. I think, to be honest, like, I think the reason that, that the guys were so up for it was uh, probably a mixture of the two was that hurt that they'd experienced, you know, in Dublin before where like New Zealand um, you know, pulled it off in the last play. Uh, and then obviously, you know, in Chicago they knew that they made the team realise that they could beat them. Mm. Uh, and they could have those massive performances. Um so yeah, I think it was probably a, a bit of both. Um, you know, a bit of a bit of hurt from the last time in Dublin and, you know, a bit of confidence from Chicago. Yeah, because like the twenty thirteen game always sticks out as the real near miss when it comes to the All Blacks. But I think what people forget as well is that a week or two after the game in Chicago, the All Blacks came to Dublin and really completely beat Ireland up, uh, bent every single rule possible under the sun. Was, was that spoken about going into this game where it's like if somebody's kind of coming in uh, at the side, if, if their rules being bent, if they start to get down and dirty, we've got to get down there with them. But was that spoken about at all going into the 2018 game? Yeah, definitely. It was. It was spoken about a good bit. Um, you know, like we felt that in the that game, the previous game, like there should have been definitely one red card, mm -hmm. potentially two, um, and obviously that flips the game massively. Um, 
So going into it, like Joe talked about, um, I think the term we used was bully in the bully. Mm. Uh, you know, and like that was just talked about our physicality. Uh, you know, and just and picking out certain players in their squad who were their like enforcers. Uh, um, you know, and making sure that that we were all over them and that they didn't get a break physically the entire game. And I think, you know, in hindsight, it was a, it was a game plan that that worked brilliantly. Who were the enforcers that he had picked out in that All Blacks team? Um, the uh, Brody, I remember Brody Ritalik was definitely one. Uh, just his physicality. Um, you know, and he is like if you watch him play, like he is a kind of like he's you know just a kind of guy that does beat people up a wee bit, like, and he does it brilliantly, you know. So he was definitely one that, that, that you know, the intent was to go after him. Your try that night, the chip and run, I think in interviews around this time when you got a couple of these sort of tries, you put it down to luck, but it must have been down to a little bit more than that. It was more than just the, the bounce of the ball, obviously. There is the athleticism to get past Aaron Smith at this point where he kind of sees you coming over his left shoulder. Uh, with the passage of time, have you looked back on that purple patch and thought to yourself, this is exactly what I was doing, that this is why things were really going my way during this point in my career? Um, yeah, yeah, to a certain extent. Um, like, obviously, actually, with being in lockdown, it's given me a massive opportunity to, like, reflect on the kind of last year, year and a half. And um, I think I've literally watched every single game that I've played in about the last two years. So I've, right. uh, like, uh, more, more just because I love watching rugby and I get bored. So I just stick a game on and I'll watch it. But, um, yeah, like, I think, to be honest, there was that there was that confidence there of being able to back myself. Um, which is probably something that like I've gone away from um, recently because uh, I, I suppose to a certain extent I've tried to be a bit too smart with my game um, you know, and trying to be a bit too tricky when realistically like, you know, I know I'm best whenever I run up defenders and try and get past them. Uh, and it's, you know, it sounds stupid, but it is as simple as that. Um, so I think, yeah, like just having, like, just having the confidence and vulnerability um, is something that, when everything's going right and whenever you're, you know, 21 and, and scoring tries all the time, like it's, it's easy to back your confidence, but whenever you've had a year that's been a bit quieter, then, you know, it gets a bit tougher. What sparked that change? What, what sparked the change in you perhaps not backing yourself fully to the hilt? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. It, probably to a certain extent, you know, when you get a couple of poor performances, um, you know, like that's whenever you start to doubt yourself, doubt mm. yourself. I think, you know, probably for me during the World Cup was when I kind of, it was the first time where I'd really um, like doubted exactly, you know, how good a player I am. Um, like, I think I've, I've definitely, you know, come, come through that. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of on the other side of that and really excited about, you know, hopefully rugby starting up soon. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of idea that, that you're, you're only as good as your last game. And, and whenever you get a couple of poor games in the bounce, then that, that confidence drops a wee bit. Was there a particular moment in the World Cup when you realised that, that that a little bit of that confidence had deserted you? Um, I think I think after the the Samoa game, um, and it wasn't necessarily that that I'd lost lost confidence. It was just the enormous amount of frustration I felt um, mm. with that game because I felt like I you know just tried everything I could to get into the game and and to score you know score a couple of tries and it just wasn't happening for me. Uh, and I was looking at other lads like you know Jordan Armour and you know Andrew Conway who are both playing who played you know very good rugby in that World Cup and um, just remember getting more and more frustrated. Um, so yeah, that that was a like a bit of a turning point for me. And then uh, coming back from the World Cup, I decided that, that I really needed you know to find a new mindset um, and change that. And how did you manage to find that? Um, again, like just kind of going back to to making sure that I enjoyed rugby. Um, yeah. And, you know, trying to find my way back into that kind of um, that confident, you know, mindset where, you know, I just want to take players on. And, and I think I have got back to that, you know, to a certain extent. I think during the Champions Cup um, with Ulster, like I felt really good or really enjoyed those games. Um, didn't score any tries and sometimes <laughs> it happens, you know, but um, yeah, I was really just happy to, with, with where I got to. Well, like it's interesting when you mentioned the Champions Cup this season, like, Possibly, I don't want to speak for you, but possibly your most memorable moment so far this campaign is the tackle against Bath. 
and it's a defensive effort. And I think a lot of the talk around you as well has been even been moved to 15 in uh, the, the red and white of Ulster as well. It's not just the, the try scoring Jacob Stockdale we're seeing now. It is uh, a multi-positional defensive Jacob Stockdale that, that we've started to see over this domestic season post-World Cup. Yeah, I think, like to be honest, that's on the flip side of what I was just saying. That's something right. that I'm massively proud of over the last year or two is that like my ability you know, as a multi-positional player Player has kind of come to the fore a bit more and that people are kind of seeing me more potentially seeing me more as like you know somebody that can actually play make and and you know understands the game uh, rather than just you know a youngster out in the wing that's pretty fast and can score a few tries um, mm. so yeah that's something that I've been you know really really happy with it's interesting when you look back at the All Blacks game just watching a bit of it this morning it felt that everybody was in such a flow state so even with the move leading up to your try, the way it felt so seamless that Bundyaki was going to turn the entire direction of the attack and all the 15 green shirts knew it was going to happen, but it took all of the, the All Blacks by surprise. Everybody was on the same page. Obviously, your, your kick goes to plan, you follow through and it's a try. Did you feel that at the time that you were in that state of flow? Because I think sometimes that's a hard thing to describe. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um like it is it's a strain it's a strange phenomenon I'd say um you know some days like some days just it doesn't feel right and you know it's just not going to plan and and it's not you know necessarily that you know you're missing 50 tackles as a team and they're running riot it's just that you know you're one or two meters away from where you need it to be to make a tackle or you know things like that whereas like on that night it just felt that like if you needed somebody in your inside shoulder to, you know, help you defend, they were there. Mm-hmm. You know, if you needed, uh, like, you know, I remember, like, um, deep inside their half, like, they all back through, like, a dodgy pass, and Kieran Reid dropped it, and I kind of, like, went through, tackled Ben Smith, and I was like, I remember thinking, like, oh, I'm going to struggle to get him into touch, and then all of a sudden, like, Johnny just comes flying in and hit, gets that second impact and batters and then in touch, and I just remember thinking, like, like I remember thinking that if this was flipped over, how like draining and just like you know kind of suffocating that, that that it would feel you know as an attack, which is exactly what you want when you're playing a team like the All Blacks. Did you notice a massive step up from the All Blacks in the intervening twelve months? Like I don't I don't think there was ever any case that or, or that New Zealand didn't take Ireland seriously leading up to even the, the Dublin game. But perhaps to just put their focus on Ireland a little bit more after that. There was obviously real debates about New Zealand versus Ireland uh, as the best team in the world, perhaps after the year of 2018. Did you feel that they'd gone up to another pitch then after you'd kind of given them a wake-up call in Dublin? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, you know, they're always going to be a team that you're going to talk about when you're talking about the top one or two teams in the world. Do you know what I mean? They're always going to be in that bracket. Um but I think, like to be honest, there's just certain times when other teams have the ability to come go ahead of them. Um, do you know? But I think, like you know, for instance, in the World Cup, it was South Africa. South Africa just got it right, and and that's when you're able to beat them. Um, but to be honest, I think you know, as a as a long term team, they've just found that that ability to be you know to be constantly competing at the highest level. Um, and I think, yeah, that whenever it came to the quarterfinal of the World Cup, you know, nearly a year later, like they were, they were definitely ready for us. Yeah. So when you're going back to look at all these games that you mentioned during the last few weeks, are you looking at the World Cup games? Is it a struggle to actually think about some of the tougher moments during your career and then actually going through the process of sitting down to analyse that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think, like, if you only go and watch, like, the nice bits, um, you know, you're just like you're living in a fairy tale, to be honest, because realistically, like, you know, players, even world-class players, best players in the world have bad games, uh, and that's something that you have to accept. Um, so, no, yeah, I go back and I watch every single game, um, and I watch the tough bits, and I make myself watch them. I don't want to, but I think, you know, it's 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 actually quite, it's like, I can remember a lot of the moments where I haven't played well, and what was going through my head at that point, and, you know, whenever... I can kind of get back into that mentality, then I can, you know, I can see why where my mentality was wrong and then I can fix it going forward. Um, like, you know, one example um, that like I can think of is actually just when we come back from the World Cup, um, we went down, Ulster went down to Thorn Park to play Munster and I had 
like a shocking game. Just didn't do anything, like nothing, like you know. And I just my head wasn't in the right space. And I remember my mentality before that game was like that, you know, I was trying to be like real, like kind of chatty and lippy to the monster boys because I figured I thought that in my head, you know, I could get a one up on them because they would think because you know obviously being in the World Cup, like I knew a lot of them and they, you know, I could maybe get inside their head, but realistically all it did was take me away from my game and what I was able to focus on and what I was good on and I had a poor game. Um and then, you know, I, I watched that and I remember thinking about that. So whenever we played Monster Home I completely flipped it and I focused on myself. Uh and I had, you know, probably my best game of the season. So yeah, I think there's 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 massive, massive benefits from looking at the stuff that you really don't want to. So you're not a trash talker then? Um well <laughs> The odd time, maybe. Like, but uh, yeah, I th- I've realized that, you know, whenever I start going out of my way to slag the boys and the other team off, even if it's banter, like, I, I just start, I stop focusing on my own game. And, and to be honest, I realized that as much as uh, self centered as it sounds, whenever I'm focusing on myself, that's when I play best. So, what sort of stuff were you saying to the Munster lads? <laughs> I <can't be> <laughs> I'm sure they're pretty well, uh, well able to give it back anyway. Uh, it's. It's interesting though, when you think about your um, your own trajectory. If we kind of say that the 2017-18 season was kind of when he started to go stratospheric and like an absolute staple of the Ireland team scoring in, in, in every game it seemed in the Six Nations that year, this is almost like your first real break, isn't it? G- given that last summer was filled with Australia and then preparation for the World Cup, like it's been a long old period, and th- this pandemic has given you the first opportunity to actually step away from the game for a little bit and like. A, I was going to go into this conversation and ask you what you've been doing with that. You've clearly used this for one really constructive reason, which is to go back and analyse old games. Is there anything else you're doing in terms of self-reflection? Um, no, I think, well, I think to be honest, like a big thing that I've focused on over the, over the course of lockdown is my kicking. Uh, I think okay. because I'm a left footer, um, you know, I kind of give an extra um, bit of, a, you know, bit of attack, uh, attacking opportunity to teams that play in. Um, so, that's something I've been working on massively is just getting that consistency in my kicking because, you know, maybe three out of five times I'll be really hammer the ball along and I'll get a great kick. And then two out of those five, like, they're, you know, not great kicks and, and um, you know, I'm just not getting that consistency. So that's something that I've definitely just tried to, like, because I realised that I could potentially have four months here where I'm not playing any rugby. I just decided to completely break down like my kicking technique and you know essentially start from scratch again. Um, so yeah, no, it's starting to come back to a place where I'm actually pretty excited about it now. Um, and like I'm look for, looking forward to hopefully bringing it in the games. And how are you managing to do that? Are, are you going out to a park? Have you been able to get into a, a practice facility to be able to, to train on your kicking? Uh, no, I've actually been I've been very lucky. Um, Malone Rugby Club is literally just maybe 30 seconds down the road from me and, and they they gave me a key for their gate so I can just kind of come and go when I please and there's n- not a soul about the place so you know it's pretty much ideal and yeah like I'm, I'm very very grateful to them because it's very generous of them. Uh, you're back in Armagh at the moment? Uh, no I'm in no. Belfast. I'm staying in Belfast so I am yeah. Because I was reading a little bit recently about Lurgan in, in County Armagh and uh, Stephen Campbell, the GEA player, was saying that it's amazing how during this pandemic all sides of the Lurgan community uh, are coming together and all different sports people are, are kind of helping out, whether it's like doing deliveries or things like that. And I think he, he was commenting in the Irish News, I think it was, just about how amazing it was and, and an amazing stamp of where the place is at at the moment that the entire community is coming together for this one cause which is to help each other out during a very tricky time yeah no definitely I mean yeah like you know you mentioned Stefan there like he's a great fella and and you know I think it speaks volumes when like the captain of the Arma GA team is is going you know to Lurgan Rugby Club which is in the middle of Mournview which would be quite you know uh, um, like a unionist sure. uh, dominated the state and he's, you know, getting bundles of food and delivering them all over Lurgan, you know. And, um, yeah, I think that, that just that's massive for the community. And, yeah, I think we've come a long, long way in that sense where, you know, like it, it doesn't really make a difference where you're from or how you were brought up. Like it's, it's you know, it's it, and it is sport that's bringing us together, which, again, is, is massively exciting, you know, for us. Like, um, 
you know, I played my first ever game of Gaelic, uh, like last year with all those boys, and it was great crack, you know. <laughs> I was shocking. I was absolutely <laughs> but I loved it. You know I mean? And it was just like, and, and that's just something that I wouldn't really have ever even thought of doing growing up because, you know, that's just, I suppose, not what you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but hopefully we can get to the point where that is what you do. And, you know, every kid goes and they play hurling, Gaelic, like, you know, football, rugby, cricket, where it's just, you know, it's like whatever sport you want to play, you just do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about that. I must ask, what position did you play when, when you were, I presume it was getting football rather than hurling you were playing, was it? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, it was good football. Yeah, I was, uh, it was full forward, like so. It was, Not bad. Uh, yeah, it was, I scored one goal, so I was pretty happy with that. Happy days. It's. Uh, I would actually. I was trying to think. Where would you play in football? I think. I think whoever was manager of that team got a spot on you. You, you were the, the ideal full forward. I think for for game of Gaelic football. Um, it's, it's actually like just when I was doing a little bit more and uh, and reading a bit of those Stephen Campbell comments, he was saying that like Clan Gael used to actually train on the Pollock Park pitch during their off season and stuff like that so this is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination no exactly like I think in fairness that's one thing that like uh like Lurgan Rook Club got really right is that mm. yeah this this has been going on for a while where you know like they're just two clubs that have a really good connection and, and a really good relationship and yeah that's that's pretty much uh how it's been for a while you say you're pretty excited now to get back to play, to to get back and put some of that practice into action. Uh, like it's looks like it's going to be a situation where we're going to have interprovincial derbies in an empty Aviva stadium come August. Are you all for that? Do, do you feel that uh, it's a safe space for athletes to go out and, and play come August? Yeah, I think so. Like you know, realistically, like we have to start somewhere, um, and I think you know, like. Like realistically, like um, in terms of I suppose a financial standpoint, like we need to get back rugby back, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. And I think there's no way, way, no better way to do that than with interprovincial players who realistically, um, like are are all you know, usually training together anyway, uh, not taking any flights, uh, and playing behind closed doors. I think that's as, as safe as it can possibly be. And and for me, like I'm just dying to get back to play any sort of rugby. Mm. Um, you know, I'd, I'd take fifteen aside on a ram on a pitch in the middle of nowhere right now, like just to just to run out on the pitch again. Have Ulster Rugby been in touch pretty much every day, or do they leave you to your own devices for the most part? Uh, yeah, they've been pretty good in terms of uh, you know, like just giving us the amount that we want, if that makes sense. Um, you know, so they're kind of like like they would contact us, be like, look here, you know, we can. We can set up a Zoom meeting to, to chat about, you know, backfield cover if you want to do it. So here's the link. If you want to join, do. If you can't be bothered, no worries. You know, and that like and it, that's not work. It's just chatting with your mates about rugby, you know. Mm. Um, in the same way, they're kind of going, look, here's, here's you know, a gym program if you want to follow it. That'd be, that'd be great. If you want to go do your own thing, like that, that'd be great, great as well. So... Um, yeah, obviously, like they've been, they've been pretty good in terms of just like, you know, giving us the opportunity to do something. But if we don't want to do it and we want to go our own way, then they're they're completely okay with that as well. I said at the top that we were going to get to your hair eventually. It looks like it was a fairly recent job on the head. Yeah, well, it's, I've actually kind of. I think this is about the fourth time that I've I've shaved it back again. So um, I'm kind of committing to it. Like, I actually, I actually really like it. It's <laughs> unbelievably handy. <laughs> like, you just shave it and then you just don't think about it for about three weeks and then you're yeah. like oh, shave again and I'll shave again for three weeks <laughs> so it's uh, it's idea I, I presume so you, sorry you've done this three or four times during this particular lockdown during lockdown yeah so I've been keeping it pretty tight and is this just out of boredom like obviously the practicality there is is a huge factor as well I'd assume uh, yeah it's practicality also that um, it, I didn't get too many great responses when I grew my hair out last time so <laughs> um, I'm thinking that I'm probably better generally with it short <laughs> don't, don't let the haters uh, hate on your hair but uh, the, the shortcut does suit you Jacob uh, listen Jacob it's been great chatting to you uh, mind yourself during the remainder of this lockdown and uh, we're all looking forward to seeing you back in action in August all, all going well no worries cheers thanks a million OTB AM this is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball.
It was like Raj Cam every time you kicked. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, it was, I mean, again, what you learned from that, myself and myself and Dave uh, got together after that World Cup and I said it to him, I said, there was a couple of kicks where I'm lining up and behind the posts, like Raj is there. And he said, next time that happens in a game, I said, I want you to have him as your target. <laughs> and you just put the ball right between his eyes. Off the ball, weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM With Aviva, Ireland's largest insurer Celebrating 10 years of iconic sporting moments At the Aviva Stadium Steve Kerr, from when he played with the Bulls From when he played with the Spurs From when he coached uh, Or was the general manager of the Suns And helped put together the 7 seconds or less team And then to when he coached the Dynasty with the Golden State Warriors, his career from beginning to end has really been remarkable for mm. someone who, if you talk to him, he'll tell you, like, he obviously wasn't the most physically gifted player in the NBA, not even on his own team most of the time, and yet carved out this really long, impressive career, not just as a player, but also as a general manager and a coach in the NBA, and has done nothing but win the entire mm. time. Yeah, because he ultimately, I mean, he goes on and, and, and leaves the Bulls, but wins the, the NBA championship the following year. So he does a four in a row. And then a lot of us of, of a certain generation introduced to him as a coach at Golden State and, you know, speaks brilliantly about everything from basketball to Donald Trump had maybe... It had passed me by the extent to which he was uh, such uh, an important figure for the Bulls. He was described in one piece I read the other day as having the look of a small town orthodontist. I mean, he's really, he's really not, your, uh, he's not your prototype. But uh, I, I wonder, is there a whole new generation of basketball fans now suddenly realizing that Steve Kerr was pretty cool back in the day? Uh, pretty cool right now. I mean, he, I think he's been pretty cool this entire time. Yeah. When you look, like, for him to play a certain role for the Bulls was fun and it was great to watch. And it was the John Paxson role that he sort of inherited. And then, as you mentioned, he went on and won again with the Spurs following year. But his playing career. Uh, was, I think, less impressive than the transition into him being an excellent, as I mentioned, general manager, an excellent head coach. There was a time when he was doing TV color commentary. He was fantastic at that. And we see somebody like Michael Jordan, who was the ultimate competitor and winner and, and arguably the greatest player in NBA history, but who has, as somebody who, who's put together a team, who owns a team, been certainly far less successful in his post-playing days. And then you have Steve Kerr, who has done, again, nothing like from his entire time in professional basketball but win. And I think that's remarkable, especially mm. because those disciplines are so very different. Like what you do as a player, what you do as a general manager, as a coach, even as a color commentator, those are all very hyper different things. And his diverse skill set is um, it's fascinating. I don't know that there's anybody else like him right now in the game. There's almost nobody like Steve Kerr in world sport. Maybe Jurgen Klopp is the closest that you can think of in terms of the managerial career, which also involves a stint of being very successful as a TV analyst uh, in the middle of it. But um, Steve Kerr, fascinating character and definitely one of the big winners from the last dance. Now, I'm delighted to say Cork footballer Kieran Sheehan is with us. Kieran, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good morning, lads. How's things? Good, thanks. Look, thanks for doing this. And um, you're, you're involved with a project from uh, Cork Football to try and raise funds for Pieta House uh, this weekend, I think it is. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, we, we've decided to come together there um, as a group, I suppose, the, the whole panel, um, including, you know, all the, the coaching staff and everything as well. And look, we, we, we decided to, to do a run in aid of Pieta House. Um, and I suppose the concept behind it is really that we're... We're getting all of our, our 34 clubs, I suppose, that are involved in, in the group together. Um, and we're going basically running from club to club through Cork. Um, as you know, it's quite a big county, so there's a, there's a few Ks to cover. So we've, um, I think it's around 430 Ks in total. So it's just breaking up the group. Um, I think it's around 10 Ks uh, per player it's working out as. So I suppose the, the idea behind it, look, we've seen a lot of, of, of support for Pieta uh, from the GA community in particular. And... We see it as, I suppose, an opportunity to kind of keep that support going and um, keep the ball rolling there. So, look, we, we've come together and, and hopefully we can we can raise as much funds as possible this Saturday for, for that run. Certainly at the start of lockdown, it seemed like people were very willing to have a conversation about their own difficulties with mental health because literally the whole country was going through an existential crisis about whether or not society was going to end and whether or not, you know, we were all panic buying and what was the right thing to do? What was the future going to look like? And people certainly seem more open about having a conversation going... Not having the best of days today myself. 
Um, I wonder if that's going to be something that we all take with us and, and actually talking about any of the organisations out there that are offering help, be it the Samaritans or Pieta House or whoever it is, that actually it is important that we have these conversations about the services that are there, but why those services are there and why they're also going to be very necessary into the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think PA have, have really highlighted that, you know, in, in these difficult times that, you know, it is something that can be impacted. And I suppose usually, you know, in life, I suppose it's very easy to get caught up in a bit of a, a your own bubble and, and forget about, you know, the looking after your own mental health. But I think that the other side of it is, is looking after kind of the mental health of others. And what I mean by that is, I suppose, just having awareness around, you know, someone a friend, a family member, someone that may be going through something that, you know, you, you don't really know or you don't really, you know, understand what's going on with them. So it's it's more of a question of just asking, the, I suppose, more of a point to just asking the question to them and just, you know, wondering if they're OK. And I think that's, that's I suppose, really, really important. And, and as I said there, Pieta have highlighted that, that it is difficult times. And I suppose this is our way of, of showing our support um, from, from that point of view. But uh, again, yeah, look, it's 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 a big change for everybody, and I suppose with change comes um, comes a lot of, uh, of 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 different different things, you know, um, be it training, be it work, um, anything. I suppose life in general. I suppose this is this has hit everyone. Um, so it's just a case of being able to manage that, uh, take a step back, and being able to to look after your own mental health, you know. I, I, one of the things I was very interested in around this kind of whole period was how professional sports people really have to stop being as selfish as they had to be to become professional sports people in the first place. And as somebody who has lived in that professional bubble, I'm really interested in your perspective about what that was like and kind of almost retrospectively how you view how selfish you do have to be to make it to the top of your profession. Yeah, that, that, was, that was something I actually struggled with. To be honest, with you. It, was, um, it was one of those things where you're, you're moving from an amateur game, obviously, into a professional and... I suppose the big emphasis and what the GA, GA is really built on is that that I suppose camaraderie, that community, um, that doing things together, we belong to something. And um, there was a big change for me when I went out there in, in adapting to this whole professional side of things because obviously you know you're together as a team and you're all you know trying to achieve the one thing, but at the same time you're you're really looking after yourself in many ways. Um, look, you're, you've you've contracts, you've your career that is there. You know, obviously money money comes into the picture a bit um and I, I i struggled with that for the first couple of years in that um there's things that you, you you do a little bit differently in terms of when just or, um i suppose just um being that bit more selfish um and just trying to kind of highlight your skills or highlight you know what you can do as opposed to doing the team thing which is something that was really kind of something i struggled with um but Again, it's 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 a cutthroat business. I think with any professional sport, there there is an element of, of as you said, selfishness. And uh, I think it's important. Like you're looking for longevity in your career as well, and it's just having that ability to just uh, put the head down and look after yourself to a certain degree. But at the same time, you have to get that balance of, of doing the team thing. So there was a whole different kind of side to things um, that that you have to deal with. And I think it's important that for any players going out there, Irish players in particular, moving from an amateur to professional sport that they're aware of that, you know? I guess it, like that's an even kind of at the work side of it. And, and maybe maybe actually at an elite level GEA as well, there is there, there has to be a selfishness about your schedule when, I guess I'm talking about the home life and the, the, the work-life balance that has become really, really important to people in the midst of this and the aftermath of this. A lot of people working from home for the first time realizing that actually, you know, not having to, spend the day commuting means I get to spend more time with my kids. And, the, you know, there's obviously difficulties when people are homeschooling, so that's not a, a one-way street of, of happiness. But you do have to be utterly selfish on a, at a family level sometimes when you're trying to pursue an elite sports career. And, and look, I hadn't really thought about this before, but maybe that's as pronounced in GAA as it is, and, and maybe a bit more pronounced, because, you know, at least professional sports people have downtime in the evenings. GAA players are like, OK, drop the work uniform, whatever that is, and get the, the gear bag and off you go again. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely agree with you there. It was a, that's another kind of bit of a, a struggle in many ways, but I suppose I was just probably starting to get back used to the, the, the swing of things um, when this all happened. But coming back from, from having that lifestyle of, you know, having your nine to five and then having your evenings off um, was, was something I was used to. And then when you came back here, it was, was really, you know, nine to 10 p.m. At night uh, 
that was something I was I was really kind of trying to wrap my head around. And as you said, there with family, look, you know, I lived out in Melbourne with my with my wife for six years, and we had that time. Um, and all of a sudden, we we're we we're, we lived down East Cork, and um, she'd be down the house on her own for for probably five of the seven nights of the evening um, until nine o'clock, and I'd see her just before bed, and, and that'd be it, you know. So. Um, it certainly takes a bit of getting used to. There, there is a lot of demand on on intercounty players, um, and I think everybody's aware of it. It's just being able to manage that, and again, it comes back to that mental health and looking after your welfare. That, you know, it doesn't come to a point where high performance is being stretched so much, um, the standards are being stretched so much that because it is going to keep going up and up, it comes a point. There comes a point where you know how do we how do we manage the guys? You know, personal development, not not just as a player and I think uh, the GPA are doing some great work around that, you know, in, in terms of trying to, to create awareness around that player development side of things. But um, inevitably, it, it comes to that boiling point where you have to make a decision around, you know, do we just lump more money into the into the personal development and player welfare side of things? Or, you know, do we have to actually start seriously thinking about maybe the professional side of things, you know? So it's uh, it's it's an argument that's probably been ongoing for a long period of time, but... Um, I think it's it's something we do need to be aware of and conscious of moving forward. Well, is, is that something we should be considering then, Kieran? Because it, it does seem that it is hard to arrest the runaway train if you take it like that for intercounty football and hurling at the moment. There's no evidence other than the obvious pandemic at the moment to suggest that that's going to slow down if things get back to normal. So, do you see it reaching the inevitable conclusion of professionalism or semi-professionalism at some point? Um, to be honest with you, I, I think the first the first step would be that uh, large investment in the the services that are provided through the, the GA and the GPA um, in terms of player development, player welfare. Um, inevitably, if, if standards keep keep getting pushed, I, I, do, I really don't know how sustainable it is um, because mm. guys that are guys that are have families I might have a couple of kids that are on an intercounty panel. Are working nine to five. They see their kids probably for a half an hour in the morning before they go to work uh, for for five nights of the week. Um, I, I I just don't see how that's sustainable. If you're if you're an intercounty player and you're lucky enough to play for you know nearly twelve years in an intercounty panel, it's um it's it's something that you know as just as Skype is not great here. We'll we'll come back to that. Back yeah, can you hear us now, Karen? Yeah, I've got you there. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. you just you just froze for a second there. Um, yeah, you were just saying you're not sure how sustainable it is, obviously, with the with the um, commitments that people have, and and ultimately something's going to break, and it feels like something kind of did break over the last couple of years in many different ways. I, I want to ask though, is this is this our chance actually to hit a reset button and go, okay, if if you are in an intercounty panel and you're training four or five times a week. Let's make it that you're only allowed to have one collective training session a week and all the rest of the training has to be done at home and you can do it any time. Like, I'm being completely ridiculous there with the one, one training session a week. But like, something has to stop, right? We can't continue to be demanding of amateur players in their pastime that they commit to this level, otherwise there's no chance of competing. Yeah, I guess, yeah, like, and, and again, you probably, you you run the risk of, you know, guys that, you know, want to experience other things in life. Like, I had, I suppose, looking at from my own angle, um, I finished up um, in 2017, so I, I had two years of living in Melbourne um, without playing or being, you know, hugely involved in a, a very competitive environment. And, you know, I got a great outlook in life, I suppose, for that two years because I essentially stepped out of the bubble Um and it was a case of you know you finish work on a Friday and you can you can relax and enjoy your few Friday beers you know as opposed to um, you know constantly thinking about performance and constantly thinking about the next session and um, and I suppose it, I think it's important that people have that outlook you know growing up um, you know guys that come through the system at the intercounty level it's important that they get that balance right because if you're heavy on the, on the one side of just GA 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 like your performance on field you know you can get a lot more out of your performance on field um if you get that balance between your personal experience and your your you know your study or your work or whatever it is and your sport you know your performance is going to improve and there's been studies that you know 
you know, prove that, you know. So I think it's, it's really important to be, we're aware of that. I think that's the first step is, is actually acknowledging it. And like, for example, in the AFL where they have, you know, a player development manager at every club, so they have that resource available to, to all groups of players. Um, we obviously don't have that here in Ireland, but again, it comes back to probably, it's probably a bit of a money issue and the resourcing side of it. And, you know, how do we manage all that? But I think, I think the next step is probably from that side of things, the player services, services point of view. That's a, it's interesting, Kieran, because like that's one of the things that actually was noticeable from watching the Michael Jordan documentary over the last few weeks is that I know, granted, it's 25 years ago, but Jordan's going out playing golf or having a few beers in, in between games and stuff. Was there almost a, a more relaxed atmosphere towards that sort of thing in the professional environment in Australia? Yeah, I, I think there was. I think there was. Um, I suppose, again, it comes back to this is your career and, you know, this is your contract. Your So it was, it was a case of, you know, particularly like for, for example, after after games, obviously, you know, that in AFL you play week in, week out. And um, after a game, like you might have an eight day break. And it was it was always just a given that, you know, fellas would go out and might have one or two or three or four, four probably max bottles of beer. And then you just go home because you're worried, like you just you want to recover and be right for next week. So. You know, and then I was, I suppose, in my time out there, I was always comparing, you know, the GA side of things versus the AFL side of things. And obviously with the drink bans, and I think things have started to change a little, little bit around the GA, around that kind of, you know, vocabulary around drink bans and things like that. But I think um, I think it was just the case of the lifestyle out there was, it was the, the culture was probably just, you know, you know, like you was, you were almost given that personal responsibility to, or personal ownership to look after, you know, yourself and your career and be ready to train because if you're not ready to train, you know, you just won't be picked. So, um, I suppose it's a, di it's, it's a bit different because you're playing week in, week out. Um, and the, the balance was, was pretty good. Um, don't get me wrong in, in the off season, I'd imagine fellas really let, let the hair down and relax and enjoy themselves and whatnot. But, um, I suppose with the GACs, I just it's it's really really important to get that balance right where you know management and everyone's roped in behind you around you know trusting you to to go out and enjoy yourself, but at the same time be ready to perform. I think that's the big issue, isn't it? Some counties are really lucky in that they have a very progressive management system that understands exactly what their role is in, in helping facilitate the growth of the players as players, but also as human beings. Because you know that old adage, better people make better All Blacks. <clears throat> And I, I think some counties are not blessed with that as well. And, and that's kind of, <clears throat> pardon me, that's my issue with the whole, um, unless you mandate a certain number of training sessions or, you know, unless the, and that, that has to be led by the players and has to be agreed with the GPA and the county boards and, and centrally, that everybody is on a level playing pitch. Like, it, it always strikes me that counties that have a, a bunch of players in Dublin, so Donegal or Mayo, they lose so much time travelling up and down to training sessions over the course, especially in summertime when they when they all travel, that there must be some better way of fostering team spirit and having a work-life balance and having a better team at the end of that. I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but I think now would be a good time for us to start having those conversations collectively with players, with coaches and with administrators to try and get to a point where the balance is right. Because if it's not, then the system where everybody trains a hundred times per matches that they play is going to continue to exist. Yeah, I, I think you're dead right. And, and you're right. It needs to be a level playing field. It needs to be, you know, across the board in terms of all, all the teams, you know, um, because you're spot on. I think um, there's a lot of a variation between each team and the, the coaching and managers are, are crucial. Like they're obviously, you know, they're, they're the heartbeat really. Like the players are kind of, you know, I suppose the, the coaches, the managers really start to, to set the culture or set the, the, you know, how they see, for example, Cork football. And then the players, you know, rope in behind it and, and they get energy from it. And then they start to take a little bit more ownership. And that's where, where the players drive it. And I, I, I think it's hugely important. And, and you, I think you might be right in terms of it could be an opportunity to actually reassess and, and see, you know, is there a way that we can actually get this balance right? Can we... You know, I think there is strict guidelines around, you know, the, the training you can do and around, you know, team holidays and going away and training, training camps and things like that. But maybe if there's a way to narrow it down a bit more um, just to get that balance right so everyone is on it. Like, it's very hard to, I suppose, to manage in terms of from an individual point of view because everyone goes out and does their own thing as well. And, you know, you're trying to trying to manage all that together as well. So I think it'd be a case of just 
yeah, team guidelines. Um, but I, I, the biggest factor here for me is, is creating that culture early within the group. Um, and if you can do that, like that's that's really what we're trying to do um, with, with, with the Cork lads is like, you know, off the back of our under 20s winning the All Ireland last year, it's really important that they're coming into something that's, you know, really solid and really set up to, to you know, achieve su success going forward. So um, that's, you know, one of the key motivators for us is, is keeping that culture really, really strong so that we can achieve the ultimate, you know. When you were coming back, was it always your intention to get involved again with the Cork senior panel? And, and were you confident enough in being able to? pick the ball up again and go, I this this all feels very familiar to me. Um yeah, I was and I wasn't. I uh, had some doubts. Um I, I was lucky enough that I, I, I chipped away with, with Gaelic football over in over Melbourne from a kind of a more of a social point of view. We played in like a, a sevens tournament and a nineties tournament there in, in the summer months and it was always a bit of crack. There was a played with Gary Owen over there. Um it and must have been a bit of a ringer in fairness. Fun. That that's a <laughs> slightly unfair that the lads who are out there and you know having their year out, and then Kieran Sheehan rolls up and it's like, hang on a second, what? Uh, it was it was it was a good standard. I think Jamie Clark played in a few. We had a few man and senior footballers. There was a there was a, it was a good standard. It was a good level. Um, um, I marked an old teammate there from from CIT, um, Steve O'Donoghue from Ballincollig, who was just a neighbour club at home, and it was just funny how we we felt like we were, we ended up marking each other in, in Melbourne, like you know might have been eight or nine or ten years on. So it was, uh, it was, it was great. It was, it's a great way to come together um, from the, the Irish side of things. Um, but yeah, that that gave me a, a small bit of a confidence that you know coming back and the transition back would be would be reasonably okay. I knew I'd have a lot to work on, but um, and I'm still working on that. But yeah, look, it was a, a reasonably good start. Like you know, in terms of um, I played a McGrath Cup game against Kerry it was my my first game back, and um, it's always good to line out like against Kerry, and and for it to be my first game back was great. Um, and you hockeyed them. Uh, sorry. And you hockeyed them as well to make things better. Yeah, we did, which is always nice. But uh, I suppose their argument is it's it's the only McGrath Cup in its early days, but. Um, but yeah, no. Look, it was uh, it was everything was was going on, going on track. Um, obviously, the league was it, it's disappointing, you know, that we couldn't kind of finish out the league as such. Whether that's going to happen or not, we really don't know. Um, for a team that was kind of moving quite well, um, I think it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's just great to be back. And I'm still the question's still up in the air whether I can um, I can fully make the transition. But um, let's let's hope uh, hope I can in good time. I know, obviously, you know, Cork in Division 3 is this kind of, it's a low point in Cork football history, but actually it's been a really good opportunity for that young team to brought in, uh, to, to bet in a bit off Broadway for you to get your your flying miles as well. And it's been a, a winning environment. So that's actually been kind of the perfect situation for, in, in many ways, nobody wanted from Cork football ever to be in Division 3, but here you are making the best of a bad situation. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, I had that conversation there with someone over the last couple of days, and um, uh, I think it is a good thing. I think we've we've experimented an awful lot with the squad that we've had. We've kind of you know brought guys in, brought guys out, and uh, I think it's it's really given us the opportunity to experiment a little bit. Um, and again, as I mentioned there before, off, off the under twenty one lads, you know, winning last year, um, I think it, it's. It's kind of brought them in, and they're winning again. So it's it's important to keep that ball rolling, you know, that you're constantly winning because you know, I guess you you build that winning mentality, and um, you know they're getting some good exposure because it is a jump up from. We're gone again. And um, you know, you'd, you'd hope that that'll kind of put us in good stead moving forward. One last thing that I just wanted to ask you about about the return to play. We're obviously seeing and having conversations about. The Bundesliga is back. It seems to be going okay. The Premier League is going to be back. I think in about three weeks' time, rugby is going to be back August twenty second. And there's some kind of loosening up around the conversation about when the GA might reopen. Um, what's your instinct about when it might be safe to go back onto the field? The, the figures are, are decent in, in many of the counties at the moment, and there is some talk about maybe underage football coming back, about club football coming back, and then it's kind of flipped again to like, well, actually, we might be able to manage into county panels quite well because they're small and the risk would be small what what do you want to happen what do you feel might happen yeah i i think it's very easy to get caught up in you know obviously everything's increased in terms of the numbers um through this whole thing and it's very easy to get caught up in in saying that you know let's let's go right back into it let's come up with a plan now and let's but i think it's you have to be very careful around i think john horn made a, a great point that time about the social distancing that 
is it really feasible to put 15 lads or 30 lads out against each other um, when there's social distancing in place? I, I wouldn't think so. I, I, I tend to agree with, with John on that one. And um, look, I'd be, I'd be hoping um, and trying to be as optimistic as possible that we would get some, some GA this year. Um, at the moment, uh, my gut feel is I'm leaning towards potentially not, but again, tr- trying to stay positive with it. But um, I think, it, as I said, it's, it's easy when, you know, people are start, starting to, you know, we're going through the phases and, you know, people are out and about a, a bit more and <clears throat> the pressure comes on and, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure for the GA to, to act on it and, and for something to happen. I think there might be something come back um, and implemented, but um, to, the, to the level of, of inter-county um, championship, I, I just can't see it happening, to be honest. Um, from the club point of view, maybe squeeze in something but again you're putting enormous pressure on guys to just you know again you have to think about the player welfare side of things here because you know if you're trying to squeeze a season out in october to december or october to january then you know does that put an awful lot of pressure on guys again straight away um and that's the question kind of we have to be asking ourselves and i think the ga and the gpa have to be asking ourselves obviously everyone wants to get back and there's an urgency to get back but I think we just have to tread water a bit until you know the, the right measures are in place um, and everyone feels safe to do so. You know, and if if people were to feel safe, say say because like by that stage you would hope that there's been a couple of months of rugby, which obviously again they're they they've had an analysis which suggests the scrums are kind of the the pinch point in terms of the. Um, proper contact uh, and as the World Health Organization would define it. So would that give comfort? I think, or do you think? to GA players that actually other sports have managed a way to do this or because they're professional is that the big gap really um I, I think the professional thing's a big the, the big gap here um like I suppose like there's an awful lot of things to consider when it comes to like the likes of insurances the likes of you know all these different things that you know the, again it comes that the responsibility of coaches within clubs like the G, G, GA community is so um wide that it's it's very hard to to manage all the different the different people and the different things that the clubs are going to do because there's so much variation. But I think ultimately the the big difference there is the professional versus the amateur um, and how you kind of control all of that. Um, but again, look uh, as you said, it's it's changing from week to week and and month to month. And like you know, you just don't know. Like who knows? There could be a vaccine in a couple of months. You know, you, you just don't know. So. Of take, being patient with it um, and giving it a chance, but of course we're all really eager to get back and get back playing. But I just this is, I suppose, in many ways it's life or death. So we just have to be really careful around, you know, how we how we manage it and how we how we deal with it. You know, it, it, which I'm sure they're the the GA are doing, um, and they have that the you know the advisory board in place and everything. So they'll just listen to the experts and and, and act on that. You know. Yeah, it's a it's a very fair point. It is literally life and death, and it's hard to sometimes remember that when you see everybody out and the beaches are going to be very busy this weekend, and everybody's going to be out having ice creams as if this never happened, and actually it did happen, and uh, we need to be careful to make sure it doesn't happen again. Kieran, I think the whole country, apart from uh, Kerry, were delighted that you're going to be back lighting up our fields sooner rather than later. So welcome back, congratulations on uh, betting back in and uh, really looking forward to seeing you playing a bit of ball soon. Thanks very much lads, I appreciate it. Thanks great, for your time. Great to have you with us. So a reminder of course, uh, that Cork GAA's fundraising run on Saturday through their GoFundMe page, you can find on Cork Club Together for Pieta on social media channels like their Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And uh, if you need help from Pieta House, you can text 51444 uh, just text the word HELP to 51444 or you can call 1-800-247-247. Now, delighted to say that yesterday afternoon we caught up with Irish singer Gavin James for the very latest episode of the OTB Culture Hall of Fame with Now TV. Good timing too, because Gavin has just announced that he's going to be performing four driving gigs in Ireland this summer. The OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for. Right, you're very welcome along to this week's edition of the OTB Culture Hall of Fame, brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show Gangs of London on the Now TV Entertainment Pass, which also has a 14-day free trial that you can avail of. Uh, watch whatever you're in the mood for on Now TV. We've had Andy Lee talking about Rocky Three. We've had uh, Dermot Kennedy on talking about Gladiator. We had Stephanie Preisner on talking about the US office. We've had Louisa Harland from Derry Girls on talking about Kamara. Last week, Andy Robertson talking about the directors. Right. This week, We've got Gavin James on, uh, talking about Back to the Future. Gavin, how are you? I'm good, man. Not too bad. I got all my Back to the Future gadgets and everything here. Ah, so, uh, you're a proper... <laughs> I got, I got is, everything. Uh, 
This is not like a passing fancy. I, I just I think it's it's gas. It's my hangover movie, to be honest. Oof. Hey, that's that's the greatest compliment you can pay a movie. Pretty much, yeah. It's anything you can watch about a million times and it's still fine. To be honest. Some people it's Star Wars, some people it's Harry Potter. For me, it's kind of back to future. It encompasses all moods, I find. Like yeah, you can be hungover, you can be unbelievably fresh after a fresh pot of coffee. It just suits everything, really. Yeah, and they're all equally as different as yeah, they're all gas. Because some people don't like the second one, but I love the second one. Some people don't like the third one. The third one, they the gas. There's a train in the third one, and it goes up in the air, and it's class. Like, <laughs> but I mean, how's things you use? How are you cope? How are you keeping? You might hear every so often a, a bang on the wall because my next door neighbors are gutting their whole house. So if you, no, if you, no better time to be doing it. Ah, so you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. Your man's real sound. Your man, that, uh, the worker's next door. His name is Johnny. He's dead sound. I was going to ask about your next door neighbors because you've been, you've essentially moved your studio into your home. I don't know, maybe you always had a home studio anyway, but like you've been playing live gigs pretty loud uh, on a fairly regular basis. So you must have a reasonable relationship with them. Oh, uh, yeah. To be honest, they're, they're, it's my, the, next, the neighbor over here on, the, on this side is an opera singer. So she's singing all day, which is great. Right. I can only hear when, when I'm in the jacks. So if I'm in the jacks, it's really calming and nice. But um, <laughs> over there, it's, um, yeah, I don't think anybody lives there yet. So the walls are kind of thick anyway. But yeah. So, I mean, they got to do what they got to do. Your man, Johnny's real sound. He's from the country. He was like, oh, how are we getting on there, Gav? How are we getting on? Real sound, fella. He said he'd, he'd do a job for me as well. But yeah. So, but yeah, no, the, the, the noise hasn't really been a problem really yet. So, I mean, I'm a singer-songwriter. I do sing really sad songs. So <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> Not doing like, I'm not like Slayer. I'm not like full on Slayer every day of the week, you know? And saying that, that does happen sometimes. But yeah. <laughs> we, we need to get you to team up with the opera singer. This is uh, the collaboration that's been waiting to happen. I have been harmonizing whilst I'm on the jacks, to be honest. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's actually gas because every time, I, like, it's, it's, it's at a certain times of the day, it happens to be a certain time. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hilarious. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely should. I, I, I hope she might, she might get the hint when I'm singing with her the next time, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, it's funny. It's Ave Maria and all that, guys. <laughs> oh, wow. Really good voice, actually. Amazing voice. Well, I, you know, that, that must be the best place in Ireland to live when everybody's out doing those on-street concerts. Is you and the opera singer going toe-to-toe? Or, you know, is it a kind of rap battle, old-school style, where you do one, she does one? Like... The neighbors are benefiting either way. Exactly, yeah. I think my wall's about to cave in, to be honest. <laughs> it doesn't sound great. But anyway, yeah, that'd be gas. Be gas. <laughs> you have been keeping very busy since this whole thing started. Like, obviously, you were, I, I think, either in the midst of or finished a, a world tour over the last 18 months or so. So you, you've been super busy. And for a lot of us, lockdown has been kind of a, an opportunity to sit in and think about the world. But you've actually been doing loads of stuff, released a new um, video for a new single, released a new single, and then had a huge announcement today that you're actually going to be getting out and doing uh, drive-in gigs. Yeah, you know what? Um, since the, I mean, I got to finish the, the kind of tour in the tree arena at the end of February. So I, I got to do that. And then about two weeks after that, everything kind of stopped for, for everybody. So, I mean, uh, the first kind of three weeks of that, I think it was the same as everybody else. Everybody wanted to kind of do everything, like learn Chinese and learn how to speak Italian, learn how to make bread and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, I mean, to be honest, I, I kind of, all my mates that are musicians, they were like, we're going to write like 25,000 albums by the end of all this. When in reality, it was like three weeks of Tiger King and pizza and beer. And that was all that we really did. But uh, but now I kinda, I'm getting into production, which is why I have this nice little mic set up and everything, which I wasn't doing before because I didn't really sit down and do it. So now I'm kind of going back and forth with my mates in London and recording stuff here, sending it to them, they're sending stuff to me. And it's, it's really, in a good way, it's really productive doing that because I never did that before I would usually sit in the room write something and then record it straight away more or less but now you sit with the song for like weeks so it's nice but um, I have found I don't know about you lads but I found like there's been like three days like a few days of the week I'd be like oh, I'm down I'm really motivated then some days just like oh, I don't do anything mm. like at all I think everybody kind of I guess there's so many hours of the day now that like it's actually it's grand to not do ask anything at all to be honest I, I think because um, everybody kind of, I, I, I'm trying to fill my day most of the days, but sometimes I just want to chill, chill the beans, do absolutely nothing. So mm. like, um, I, I keep saying to my mates, because like they're keep wake, sometimes you wake up and be like, oh, you, you have to fill the day with something. But yeah, sometimes it's better to just take a breather, I guess. And if you want to treat the whole thing as a breather, that's, that's good, I guess. Did, did you feel the pressure at the start, Gavin, to be productive all the time and to write 25 top class albums? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I wanted to kind of, I, I was, I guess I was looking at other people doing stuff like my mates in London and uh, they were recording. Then I started chatting to all of them and saying like, 
maybe we should take a little bit of a chill. Like just not do anything for a little bit. And uh, even like my, my missus is uh, studying for a college course. And like, it's the same thing. Like, so if you don't do something during the day, you might feel guilty at the end of the day because you didn't do it. Whereas you shouldn't really feel guilty for not doing anything, you know? But uh, I actually, I have found it very productive now because I've kind of found the balance between both. Found the balance of watching like all of Netflix in one day and yeah. the next day spending all the day in front of the piano. So I have kind of found the balance in that way, but yeah. And cooking things, cooking everything. I'm having barbecues mm. and stuff in class. What are you cooking? I have been cooking. I did steak. I took a look, I'm trying to do like perfect. Not not every day because that would be terrible for my health. But um, I'm doing a lot of barbecues and kind of burgers. I, tr- I made a cookie the other day, like a giant cookie, like a massive cookie. Mm. Yeah, it was class. It was uh, like a medium rare cookie. So as you further you got in, it was kind of like a subway oh, cookie. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it grew soft in the middle. It was class. But um. Yeah, just kind of stuff. I just yeah, just cooking out of pure boredom, pretty much. But I'm learning how to cook instead of just delivery and everything all the time. <laughs> it's good for you though. It, it's one of those things that like um, it was a cliche that everybody's making banana bread and bacon at the very start. But actually, it does give you the sense of I made this thing and actually it's not just edible. It's quite nice. There's exactly. like a, and it becomes quite addictive after a while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's especially because like. There's so many things. I love the really quick ones on the internet. You know, the ones you find on Facebook where they just do it in like a minute mm, and they just yeah. show you what they're doing and you just try follow. I did like roast potatoes on Sunday and they were a class. Like they just looked up like something on TikTok that was roast potatoes in it. it. Took like an hour to do, but like they were deadly, like deadly. Whereas beforehand it was just like get the bag roast potatoes. Now to be honest, I'm still going to do the bag roast potatoes today because an hour is just, it's a long time to cook roast potatoes. But um, yeah. What's your roast potatoes recipe? Whatever that guy had on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find it. He, it's just usually him like, these are the best roast potatoes in the world. And then just followed exactly what he did. Pretty much. It'd probably just take a few more goals to learn it off by heart. So you can... Oh, 100%. Yeah. Okay, fair um, I'm a sieve, to be honest. Everything, just, I, like, if you tell me something today, it'll be gone tomorrow. So I haven't got a lot of space <laughs> in my head. For things like that. Tell us about the drive-ins. Because um, there's definitely a sense that drive-ins are going to be like the way of the future. We're all going back to the 50s. Back to the future is very uh, appropriate here. That like We're all going to end up having, experiencing things in our cars, socially distanced in our little family units from now on. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's, it was an idea I had. Me and, me and Edison actually had a, a couple of, about a month or two ago. And uh, I think some lads in Europe did it already. And uh, it just seems, at the start, it was more to just get all the crew and get the get everybody paid because nobody's worked for like months and it's it's so it's it's shit for like um the industry for the live music industry in ireland and it's it's terrible so i mean to be honest like i've seen a lot of things online like about like how it's going to work and uh to be honest, I, I, the lads that i have with me edgy is my front of house guy and keith is my stage manager they're like geniuses they're like class so they figured out a way to um make it set because there, there were so many little like boo-boos when it's when it happened in in europe so there's a way of doing it where you have the speakers going and then you tune in in your car as well, but you have to like delay all the cars listening to it. So there's no weird madness going on while I'm playing at the gig. And it's, but other than that, there's going to be like a big giant screen behind me. I'm going to be playing with my buddy, Jeff, who's going to be socially far away from me. Um, and everybody's going to be socially far away in the cars. And uh, it's going to be, it's going to be great crack to be honest. It's more for just looking after everybody in the industry because people haven't worked since February. So you know, it's 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 pretty shit for for them. Mm. Cause like that's been a, the thing, Gavin, is that musicians have done some amazing things over the last few months, but they've all been for free. Like it's all been Zoom or Instagram Live and giving away your content essentially for free. We all know that the music streaming services don't pay enough. You're not going to get a, a big spike from the spike in people listening to music at home at the moment and maybe on Bandcamp day when people are buying merch you might have got a spike but other than that it's it's very very hard to see where the revenue is coming from at the moment yeah i mean the live rev the live gigs were always the main thing for for most uh, people i mean to be honest i am i'm lucky because i can put stuff out in general it's like my mates can't just go i'm gonna tune this guitar and put it online and then get ro- royalties from you sure. know it's it, you know, I release boxes and I release a video for it and I, I, can, I can release songs and a lot of other artists can release music and there's loads of different ways of doing things. Um, but the live music um, industry in general, loads of weird noises coming from there. <laughs> uh, the live music industry in general, it's, it's going to suffer so much. So any way in general to, I think my dog actually turned the telly on. 
That's what it is. My dog's sleeping on the couch. He rolled over on the remote and the TV is on. That's hilarious. I'll let him watch. I don't know. He's watching Holly Oates or something like that. But anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's, the way of doing it, I mean, in reality, I'm just trying to find a way of uh, getting the industry, getting people back to work pretty much that hadn't been working for months. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. Like when it, when it becomes more um, fluid and people can actually come over to houses and stuff, I was going to do the live streams again and get like my crew to be in the kitchen and the camera crew in the front room. And that's another way of doing it. And this is the Zoom quizzes and all that where you can, you can do this very similar thing, Zoom gigs, which I think a lot of people are doing in America at the moment. But um, yeah, that was, the, that was the main thing really for me. It was just looking after my own and looking after people who have been the backbone of the whole industry for the last, uh, however, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know. When you got to the end of your world tour and there's a sudden end to being on the road for such a long period of time as well, on a personal level, did you just miss the fact that you were going out in front of big crowds and playing songs that you loved and they were singing the words back to you? Like that must be something that it comes to an abrupt end. There's a decompression period anyway. And all of a sudden you're like, don't leave your house. Don't go anywhere. Don't speak to anybody. Don't touch anybody. Yeah, pretty much. It's, um, yeah, there's nothing better. I was, I was thinking I was chatting to Danny from the Coronas about this and he's dying to do a gig. He's like dying as much as I am. And as much as all the lads are in my band are like, it's, 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 it's going to be some buzz when it actually starts up again, whenever that is like, it's going to be mental when everybody's just in the crowd and everybody's singing along to everything. And even when like, I've never released a song without kind of backing it up with the tour or backing it up with a few gigs. Cause it, like, I didn't even really get to test boxes and usually a test. Like I did, I did play it in the three arenas, so that was a good little show. But I mean, nobody, nobody knew anything about it. So, mm. like the likes of even last time we released something was always, and we did picnic like two weeks after the release, and it was main stage, and it was everybody singing it back to you, and it was it was absolutely mental. So like you don't get that feeling obviously from a live stream or from you might get it from the cars. You never know. Somebody might bring like a, a big horn with them or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a big horn. That's a weird thing to say. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be it, that, that. The drive through gigs are gonna be a, a learning curve. I think it's just it. You know, it's just it, it's adapting to the situation. I think that is at hand. I think, and I think a lot of people are gonna follow suit. From what I've heard, people are gonna start doing the same thing. Well, it, that's the thing. Like being being the the first person means that you are being a bit of a guinea pig and you are taking a bit of a risk. But it kind of feels like you feel a responsibility to the industry that. You know, like a lot of people in a lot of industries are like, well, I've, I've kind of reached a certain level now. I look after my crew, but that's it. But actually, you know, you're genuinely taking a bit of a, going on a bit of a limb here. Because if it, if it doesn't work and there's, and there's a bit of blowback for it, you're going to put your hands up and say, look, we tried. We're yeah. the ones like trying to make things happen here. Yeah, I mean, you can either try. I mean, to be honest, I trust my crew like a lot because they've been with me for the last eight years. And I know we can definitely pull it off, you know, and I, in general, there will be like a few learning curves when it comes to the first one and the second one and the third one. But like we have, I mean, to be honest, it depends how many we do. We could do like, there could be a hell of a lot of these coming, like, which is even better for because people will be getting um, the paydays, all the techs and everybody getting paid for it and stuff. So it's going to be perfect for them. And, and just kind of even paying rent, like they can't, like some of my mates that, but lads that work in the industry can't even pay the rent. So it's, it's fair. So it's the same with anybody else in any other industry that can't work during these times. It's the same thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I don't, I could give a, I, I don't know, I could give, like, really give a fuck if people don't like me or or do or do like me. Like, I'm gonna do it anyway, to be honest. And it's it's more, it's not, it's, you know, it's not really even about me. It's more just about looking after the industry as a whole and looking after people and hoping that other bands and other people do as well. So, um, I think it's that's the main kind of thing about it, really. Have you thought about where and when you're gonna do them? Yeah, so we're going to do them. I mean, I have them all here. So that it mm. starts in exactly, I think, it's exactly two months. So Limerick is the first one on July 24th. And then the 20, or the 31st is Cork. And then August 7th is Tremor. And then uh, in Waterford. And then we got Gowron, Racecourse, and Kilkenny on August 10th. And then in around that, there's like matinee shows, four o'clock in the day. And then there's like eight o'clock shows at night and stuff. So there'll be a lot of them going on. And then there's, there's loads more to be announced, I'd say. Brilliant. So but it's all, obviously, it's all um, HSE. The guidelines we're going by, what the government are telling us and what HSE are saying, like, if, if anything happens, obviously, it'll be pulled. But, um, yeah, we're all just pretty much, we're going with whatever they're saying. It, it's an amazing think. innovation, Gavin. And I, like you say, it doesn't matter if people don't like me or not. I can't see anybody disliking that idea, to be honest with you. I think it just makes sense for everybody possible. And, like, it, it, it should be sparking a wave of people doing something similar. 
my question though is when do you feel that we might actually have the reality of live gigs back again like in this reality of social distancing do you think it is a prospect like could you have imagined playing the three arena for example with social distancing being implemented because i see that there was reports from ticketmaster in the united states a couple of weeks ago that they're looking into like pods where you and your friends can yeah. sit in or stand in that circle that's kind of chalked out in yeah. the ground and then there's another pod here and there yeah that's terrifying i don't know <laughs> i don't know how <laughs> that is absolutely terrifying i mean <laughs> I don't know if any of the venues can really work. Um, yeah. Because, you know, if, if you're looking at, like, say, even the Olympia, like if, if it's, there's 1,650 people that go in there, if you're going to social distance in there, it's going to be, what, like 400 people maybe you're going to fit in there. Do they even break I mean, even in that, in that I case? Wouldn't, I wouldn't say. I, don't, I, I can't see it happening unless you charge a fucking 1,000 euros of fucking tickets. <laughs> No, um, sorry if this is on the radio. <laughs> I, I would probably pay a thousand euro to go to live music again. To be honest, at this. Oh, point. to be honest, <laughs> jump right on that. But uh, no, but I, I don't know how it will work. Uh, social distance at gigs. If, if, if there's a way, I mean, there's definitely some places that might be able to figure it out. But uh, I, I don't know. I think I, I just want it to be back to back to normal, where everybody's just squashed up against each other, and there's no worries, and this is all over, and people can just dance and. And meet new people because the whole thing about going to a gig is like sharing the experience together, you know, and like meeting new people. I love going to gigs and even going to festivals and stuff, and just like meeting randomers on the field and just having a drink and just floating around and having the crack. Whereas if you go, I mean, obviously, this is a, this is the like in the times we're in doing the drive-in gigs is just an idea, is an, is an idea, and like a, an idea that was racking my brain for the last couple of weeks about how it was going to work, and and it, it will, I hope, work in the front from the first one or the second one. But um, yeah. When the gigs come back, it's going to be the big giant party, I think. So mm. I'm hoping it's sooner than later, to be honest. Yeah, I think it, look, we feel the same about when sport comes back properly. The behind closed door stuff, it's grand. It's going to do for now. But um, everybody wants crowds back and the chanting and the tribalism and meeting new people and having that shared experience. Because that's kind of what draws us all out from the shell that we live in as human beings isn't it? that kind of exactly. that shared experience that any sense of community exactly i think that's the whole kind of i'm trying to see i'm trying to turn the tv off from my apple remote on my phone <laughs> your, your, your door just mysteriously open behind you as well gavin so you either have a, a very small dog or a very large ghost in your house i actually have a very large dog and a very small ghost in my house oh, hey and <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> i should have off turn that off let me see. I figure it out. That'd be grand. But um, yeah. So where were we? <laughs> Talking about the community and like how important it is to actually get people together again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's what's going to be the best part of when this is all over. Is kind of going back, even going back into pubs and going back into into. It's just going to be a giant party. It's going to be Paddy's Day all over the world, pretty much, isn't it? It's yeah. Gonna, it's going to be amazing. Be the leaders of that. It's going to be. Let's hope. Let's let's talk a little bit more about um about Back to the Future. When did you realize that Back to the Future was your hangover movie? Because I'd say you know it's like you have to work through a few to go yeah yeah this is good. No, I've had enough of that. But if this is something you can return to again and again and again after however long you've been doing this, uh, it's obviously something special. Yeah, I mean to be honest, I used to, used to like order a Pizza Max at seven o'clock at night and just watch all the three um Back to the Future movies when I was doing the gigs in the pubs. I used to do gigs in the pubs when I was like seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, and then uh, yeah, I just I found it very pleasing just to sit down and just mind-numbingly watch all of them again and again and again and again and again and again, and again. so it's great crack but yeah i love it and i have all the mad memorabilia as well i have all the like the crazy the cars i have a floating car that i got from tokyo it actually floats it's hilarious now i have to find the plug for it so i can't show you but it's hilarious <laughs> and it has the lights and everything on it it's gas i got it on amazon it's, it's hilarious but yeah this, 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 i love them they're class It's um, so I, like when we look at Back to the Future, it's 1985. And like, at what age are you when you first approach Back to the Future, or Back to the Future approaches you, and you're like, "This is my happy place. This is the thing that makes sense to me." Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, I, I just love the, the writing in it, and even the history of it, like the way somebody else played Mary McFly, and uh, they did like half the movie, and then they had to reshoot the whole movie again because it wasn't working. Mm. And like, just, I love the, how it all came about and there's a really small budget to it. And it, it's just, it's just a class movie. Every, every scene is just, you never, you know, sometimes you have a favorite movie, you have a favorite thing. You sometimes you skip some scenes, you skip some parts of it. I never really seem to skip any of it. Just kind of watch it straight through every time. What I, I mean, is, 
I didn't know that um, Marty McFly wasn't Michael J. Fox the whole way through. I just assumed that like he was born to play the role. It was somebody else. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, you know, somebody else, actually. If you look it up online, yeah. I don't know. I can't Eric Stoltz. That's the name. Yeah, Eric, Eric. Stoltz. He's supposed to be he was really good, but, the, but for some reason, it just wasn't working. It wasn't funny enough. Yeah, exactly. And dude, Michael J. Fox, he just smashed it. Like, he just, like, obviously, he's hilarious. And even, mm. even his voice in general, when he talks, he just sounds like... He just sounds class. And even when he picks up the guitar at the end, I mean, I love music, obviously, but um, it made me want to play Johnny Be Good on the guitar. It made me want to like, get a red Gibson ES-335 and have it and stuff. But yeah, it's, it's just class. Every, there's everything in the movie that you want. Like, it's, it's class. Is he any good at music? Oh, did you not see him? He did a gig with Coldplay, supposedly. Did he? I, I didn't yeah, see they him. actually played Johnny Be Good with Coldplay in some gig in America, I think, recently, like about a year or two ago. I watched it. It was it's actually class. Right. I, I haven't seen that at all because I, I was never sure uh, whether or not he was. It, it always seems brilliant because he's just got so much charisma. You know, when some, somebody is just so charismatic that it covers up any failings that they may have uh, at being a, a sort of musician. And I, I often wondered if that was the case with Michael J. Fox. But obviously what you're saying, he's, he's actually got it. Yeah, yeah, I suppose he, uh, they, you can kind of tell in the movie that he's obviously miming the guitar bits, but he's actually he's playing it. Like, you know, he's, he's definitely playing it. But um. Yeah, I just love it. I think it's last. Like even the Earth Angel, Earth Angel, and he's disappearing and stuff at the end. It's just <laughs> whopper, whopper. Buzzer. Have you have you decided that there's some point in your life where you're going to treat yourself to that guitar? Does something have to happen, or have you already kind of sneakily been buying one? Is there one off screen here? You're like, actually, I have it. Just you know, I don't actually have one. No, uh, there was one I was looking at that's not actually that guitar, but it's a it's a flux capacitor guitar. So it's a big <laughs> silver flux capacitor, and it has batteries in it, and you turn it on, and it does the whole thing. It's unbelievable. I, I, I'll try. Actually, I'll probably be able to find it, but it's it's uh, oh, it's unbelievable. It's last looking. But I was trying to trying to get it. I think it's somewhere in Asia. You can order it. From. It's, like, it's like 400 euros. It's probably a craft guitar, but it looks absolutely hilariously amazing. To be honest, it's classic. But for a film that got the 21st century so hilariously wrong, was it was 2013, wasn't it? Or was it, was it, was it 20? It was 2015. Maybe it's 2015. It was like it's May. 2015. May, Sorry, yeah. It, it would have been like fives. That. Yeah. yeah, like they got it so wrong though. Yeah, <laughs> like it's but it's amazing how enduring the film is. As in, I don't know. Sometimes cinema can transfer poorly down through the ages. If you show this to a young person right now, I'm sure it would still be enthralling, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, I mean it's like I mean my mate Matt. I was chatting to my mate Matt, who's my drummer in the band, and uh, same. He's watching uh, all these old movies. He's was started watching Harry Potter with his youngest, and his youngest is only like five or six. And um, but same with Back to the Future. Started watching Back to the Future, like just loved it. Loved it. I mean, some of the things they actually got right from the second one, if you watch the second one, uh, there's like, uh, they put the pizza in the oven. Mm. It's just, it's, it's done. Like, this is before, I think it was, and there's another part where they do FaceTime. Mm. And like, nobody had thought of FaceTime yet. And like, so there's certain things they got right. Obviously, they got the Well, the pizza is tiny. Yeah, the pizza is tiny. And then actually, yeah, I was thinking that, obviously, that <laughs> this, that'd be absolutely class if that exists. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> that's why I stopped myself. I was like, nah, that's not, that doesn't exist. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, the, even like the FaceTime and stuff and like, it's weird the way they had two of like all the new things that they had a fax machine when they had a when they had a FaceTime thing. Mm. So like he's getting fired by his boss and he's talking to him through FaceTime, and then he just gets a fax of like you're fired, like, <laughs> like it's old and new, but yeah. um, <laughs> makes no sense. But uh, yeah, it's gas. I mean, even like yeah, the, the tower and all when when Biff is like king of the world and like he's he just reminds you of trump or something it's very funny mm. but um it's so it's such a good comparison there, there's also like an unbelievable creepiness around biff and uh actually really distressing scene involving biff and marty's mother when uh like he's it's borderline assault actually in the convertible car mm. i'm trying to think like in fairness we've all watched the christmas probably last time so it's yeah. actually fresh enough in my memory but uh, there's a lot of things you, that uh, you couldn't get away with now or certainly look really, really bad now. Biff was a nasty piece of work, I think it's fair to say. Oh, yeah, there's mad things in it, to be honest. Like, there's a... Uh, that's probably Biff knocking at the second wall now, to be honest. Um, yeah, there's mad. Even, like, yeah, in the car and Biff is... Yeah, Marty is actually about to kiss his ma at some point. And, like, it's just... That's also weird. weird. <laughs> it's, weird. it's like Friends if you rewatch Friends there's certain episodes where you're like Ooh, that's oh that's you wouldn't say that now would you or yeah you? but yeah I think yeah it's uh, obviously a different time that you live in now like if you watch anything from back then like there's some mad mad things you'd never get away with like mm. ever but uh, yeah especially yeah, that Biff bit when he gets punched in the face by uh, by Marty's dad it's, it's gas because he's literally just like 
And the face on him as well. The face on Marty's down when he goes, he's just like, <laughs> and he gets him. But uh, yeah, it's mad the way they get, got away with it back then, but not so much now. Yeah. Yeah, the, the tiny pizzas traveled well. The incest did not travel well, I think it's fair to say. No, when it, it didn't comes to not. Back to the never. future. <laughs> never does. <laughs> you know. uh, like, what, also, what is the. Sorry, I'm, I'm asking just for like uh, quick updates on this, assuming that you know all the inner workings of the plot here. What, 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 what was the story with the Libyan terrorists? That's like. That I, was I so what, weird. And he had the bazooka and everything at the top of the car. Yeah. Like, it was all for the, for the what you call it, for the, for the green stuff. The plutonium. For the plutonium, yeah. It's like, they found me. I don't know how they found me, but they found me. It's like, <laughs> it's so random. It's like, why? Why did you rub it off them, Doc? Well, his, Doc is dodgy. Doc was quite dodgy, to be honest. You know? He really was. He was. He had plutonium and everything. Like, it's madness. Madness. And then he just created a garbage one that works with garbage. It's, it's, it's crazy how it all works. But, uh... <laughs> To be honest, while I'm doing this interview, my whole house is collapsing and my dog is eating whatever's in the kitchen. I left like, so I, I got like some mugs from Amazon and he's eating the boxes and the TV is on and everybody's banging. And I don't know. But it's all happening in the house right now. Well, look, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. But I just wanted to ask, like, you obviously love movies and you, um, you've done a little bit of acting. Is that something that you see in, in, as part of your future? Um, I'm shocking, shocking acting. Um, I don't know if I'd ever give it a go. I mean, to me, I'm I'm mad into the musicals and all that. So if I was ever gonna do something like that, it would have to be like a musical and I have to sing along the whole time. But um, yeah, I don't know. I did acting when I was in in Brazil. I had to do like a telenovela and I had to like act. But it took me ages because they had to, they told me to do it in Portuguese, and obviously my Portuguese north side Dublin accent didn't really work. <laughs> um, and like they just eventually were just like, can you just say hey, Louisa? This song is for you. And I was like, how are you, Louise? This song is for you. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely hilarious. But um, I didn't get the acting job the next time. I just had to sing a song, uh, you know, which, was, which was much easier. Singing a song is handy. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, gas, gas. I don't know. You never know. You never know what the future holds. I'm like, I'm like yeah, be on EastEnders yet. You never know. And the Zoom, the Zoom quiz has obviously been something that has swept the culture, but you kind of seem to have perfected the art. You'd over a thousand people on recently. It's, oh man, it's pure mayhem. It's hilarious. It's, it's so much fun. I just, I constantly, like I had a thing was, uh, I had this one part of the quiz about Lionel Richie. Well, actually it wasn't really about Lionel Richie. It was, uh, I can't remember what exactly, but I just kind of had Lionel Richie in the background. I was like, hello, <laughs> is it me you're looking for? I don't know why. And it was literally me in a, in a puzzle and you had to find me. And then I just went to the Jacks and I waited until <laughs> But uh, it's gas, because the amount of things you can do in it, you can just, I mean, I did a lot of like scavenger hunts. So the last one I did was like run to the jacks and get like jacks around the first person back wins. And then when they come back, it's like, you win nothing. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's so much fun. It's just seeing people. And every time something funny happened, I was just like, Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gas. It's so much fun. Like the stuff you can do on it is just hilarious. But uh, it's, it's just a bit of a break for everybody as well. Because it's nice, because there's loads of kids on it and with their family and everything, just having a great time. And it's, yeah. It's gas crack for everybody. You know, to be honest. Do you think? Do you think you'll do any of that stuff? Like when you're free to go out and you're free to leave your house, has any of this been so much crack that you're going to go? Actually, I'm going to do a little bit of this, like once a month or once every six months, or have a special giveaway for whatever. Like, is there something that you think that might be part of who you become as a performer after this? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, the, the Zoom is it's just a new way of being on social media and a new way of uh, chatting to your fans. Really, you know, it's, it's and bringing people together. So anything that does that is it works anytime no matter no matter if there's a lockdown or, or anything you know um i might do a live one at an actual gig i'll do like a pre quiz i'll support myself as a quiz master and then i'll do the live gig afterwards which could be absolutely hilarious like but actually that'd be terrifying for me actually i don't know if I, that, that many people are looking at me doing a quiz that'd be shockingly that'd be, that'd be terrifying no i wouldn't do that'd that that'd be class yeah, but stay on zoom no that's I leave it to the, like, oh no, that's terrifying. <laughs> you could ask the audience, literally, and it would be like everybody in the audience. Answering yeah, the imagine question. asking like, imagine asking like 13,000 people three me in a run to the jacks and get some bog roll there. <laughs> <laughs> Stampede. Oh, big ass, big ass. Soon enough, soon enough, it'd be all back to normal. Be great. Soon enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, you mentioned boxes, I think, was it the 12th of May you released it? And you had a million listens on Spotify and a million views on YouTube within a week with that would so suggest that the appetite for your music is even stronger than it's ever been. Yeah, you know what, it's mad. I've never seen something move like that on YouTube before ever for me. So I mean, usually it takes a lot longer than that. But um, yeah, it seems people seem to be um, liking the song and, and uh, kind of like kind of seeing themselves in the song a bit because it is very just a really simple message in the song about just following your dreams and like just doing like 
what, what you want and kind of going against the grain. And if anybody tells you to do it, not do it, to just tell them to take off. So it's, it's very simple message of a song. It's a really short song. It's, so I've been dying to release it for, for ages. I mean, it was done three years ago. I've been sitting on it for ages. So yeah, it's, it's, it's grand. It's a good L. Was it, was it totally all about a rap though? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I wrote like, there's a lot of lyrics in it. The first lyric is like, went to the wrong school, wearing the wrong shoes. I mean, I went to Deco's in Cabra. And if you wore like Nikes or like brown shoes into school, you had to go to the principal's office and wear slippers for the rest of the day. So like, I kind of got a lot of the lyrics from that kind of stuff. And like, say three Hail Marys and everything bad will be gone. We went to like, a, it was obviously a Catholic school. So like, even though, even though they never had my size, I'm 11 and a half sh- shoes. So I never had my slipper size anyway. So it was grand. But like, yeah, it's just hilarious. Like, even in school, I used to have hair down to my arse in school. I used to have, like, really long, massive, like, locks. Like, insane. Going down, like, like Robert Plant kind of hair. And he used to tie it back. And he used to be going by all the classrooms like a goldfish because I had to tie it back. <laughs> it's just hilarious. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just about following whatever you want to do and not really... Because it kind of bored me when teachers would t- or, anybody, or anybody would tell me that that music is a hard kind of graph and it's a hard thing to do because I didn't really care if it was hard because I just wanted to play anyway so like it kind of came from that aspect of it because it, it didn't really matter what anybody said I just wanted to do that one thing and nothing else so that and watch Back to the Future all the time it's a good combination it turns out yeah it's a, it's a good one well, listen congratulations to the, uh, the new gigs and honestly like anybody who's taking risks and trying to come up with ideas for everybody to get together again, I think it has to be loaded. So it is brave and uh, we wish you every success with it. Thank you, man. Thank you very much, man. Cheers for having us on, lads. And uh, yeah, I'll see you hopefully at one if you bring the, oh, you can't bring the camper. I was going to say bring a camper with you, but you can't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thanks for having us on, lads. Cheers, Gavin. Thanks a million, man. Yeah, great stuff from uh, Gavin there. A reminder, of course, the OTB Culture Hall of Fame is with you every week. It's brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show, Gangs of London, on the Now TV Entertainment Pass, which also has a 14-day free trial that you can avail of. Stream unmissable shows like Rocket Man and Lion King, Game of Thrones and Parks and Recreation, or Inside Out and Toy Story 4. You can find all of our previous episodes as well on the OTB Podcast Network. So with Lenny Abramson last week, we've had... Um, Stephanie Preisner, we had a great discussion about Rocky Three with Andy Lee and loads more good stuff. Yeah, TV Culture Hall in association with Nair TV. You'll get it as well on our YouTube channel. We'll see you next week. The OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for. OTB AM. With Aviva, Ireland's largest insurer, celebrating 10 years of iconic sporting moments at the Aviva Stadium.